Good evening. I'd like to call this meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission to order. It's our August 9th, 2021 uh, meeting. If we'd all please uh, rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And before I get on with uh, any items on the agenda, I'd just like to read this you know, announcement from, uh, it was put together by our uh, corporate council, and it's to all attendees who are, uh, all attendees are required to comply with Executive Order 13A, which requires that any person while indoors in a public place who does not maintain a safe social distance of approximately six feet from every other person and who is not fully vaccinated for COVID-19 shall cover their mouth and nose with a mask or cloth face covering. Compliance with this executive order is required for all attending the meeting. So I just ask everybody uh, to please comply with this. Which brings us now to uh, our uh, call to order. I'd like to introduce the members of the commission that are here this evening. To my far right is uh, commission member uh, Jeff Cohan. Next to uh, Jeff is uh, Jamie Hine, who's an alternate on the commission. To my uh, far left is Armin Menard, who is a uh, alternate on the commission. To my immediate left is uh, Steve Allenson, also an alternate on the commission. At the uh, lower table, to my left, the staff table, is Cheryl Ann Tubby, our recording secretary. And next to Cheryl Ann is Kevin Pingini, who is our town planner. And then sitting at the first row is Amy Torrey, who is our zoning enforcement officer. Uh, next item is consideration of our minutes. However, as there are several members of the uh, commission uh, who were at our prior, uh, last month's meeting are uh, not in attendance, we're going to uh, we're going to defer that uh, until our September meeting. It brings us to our first item on our agenda, which is uh, item number one. It's a special permit. It's for Montana Construction and Five Research Parkway. We had closed the public hearing uh, last month and uh, fully anticipated voting on the application, discussing the application, and voting on the application this month. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Early today, one of the commission members uh, informed me that there was a business commitment that came up uh, that he was not able to uh, relieve himself from, if you would, uh, so he would not be attending. Uh, you know, I initially had uh, contacted the applicant and asked the applicant, because we only would then have four commission members uh, to vote on that particular application, to give the applicant the uh, option of uh, either having the commission discuss and vote on the application or continue it to our September meeting. Uh, prior to the applicant getting back to it, I had, back to, uh, to me, I talked to other commission members and we made the decision uh, that the commission, uh, given that the fact that uh, that application, uh, we had three meetings on, there was a substantial amount of presentation by the applicant as well as from staff, uh, from outside uh, 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 third parties. Uh, as well as from the public, and we felt it was important uh, that we have five commission members uh, act on that application. Uh, so the decision was made by the commission, although we do have a letter, and I'll ask Mr. Allenson just to note the letter from the uh, applicant uh, that we received subsequent to the commission making its decision, asking us to defer action. So uh, that application will not be discussed and not uh, be uh, voted on this evening. Uh, the commission has until September 16th to make a decision on that application. So we fully expect that at our September meeting, we will have uh, five commission members uh, that will be uh, at the meeting uh, that will be fully uh, informed on the application and ready to vote on the application. I just do remind everyone that the public hearing you know, has been closed, so the commission you know, does not receive uh, any additional uh, information from staff, from the applicant, or any additional communication from the public. Uh, and uh, that's, that's kind of where we are in that application. Uh, I, I know some people may be noting, gee, you have five people here. Uh, Mr. Menard, uh, quite candidly, I was not expecting him to be at the meeting this evening, but 
uh, Mr. Menard did not participate in any of the uh, any of the app, uh, Amazon applications, so he would not be in a position uh, this evening to to act on the application. So why, theoretically, we have five people here. We only have four people, four individuals that would be uh, in a position to uh, to discuss and vote on the application. So that's where we stand on that. Uh, and Mr. Allison, if you just please note for the record the uh, letter that we did receive from Robinson and Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> There's a correspondence from Robinson and Cole to Chairman Seichter dated August 9th, 2021. Thank you. And with that, it brings us to our uh, second item on the agenda, which is a uh, special permit, 1070 North Farms Road, LLC, 1711 Northrop Road and 2 Northrop uh, Industrial Park Road East. And again, this is a continuation of the uh, public hearing. So I would ask the applicant, and again, I, just before uh, we began the, uh, the meeting, I did ask the applicant uh, initially that we only had four commission members, but as you can see, we now have five. Uh, so at this point in time, again, Mr. Allenson, if you would please note uh, all additional items for the, uh, for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have an interdepartmental referral, uh, date of submission, March 4th, 2021 from our fire marshal. An email from Dennis Senaviva, dated 3-31-21. An inter-office memorandum from Eric Kruger, senior engineer, dated April 8th, 2021. A memorandum from the Department of Engineering, dated April 28th, 2021. Correspondence from Thomas Talbot Planner, dated April 29th, 2021. Memorandum from Vanessa Bautista, dated April 29th, 2021. Correspondence from James and Shirley Shadish, I apologize if I mispronounced that, dated May 14th, 2021. Email correspondence to Kevin Pagini, dated 5-6-2021, from Shirley and James Shadish again. Email correspondence from Dennis Senaviva, dated May 6, 2021. Email correspondence from Dennis Senaviva, dated 6-10-2021. Multiple correspondence and comments dated May 11th, 2021 from David Sullivan, PE. Correspondence from Soli Engineering dated June 29th, 2021. Correspondence from Hallisey, Pearson, and Cassidy, dated June 28th, 2021. Interdepartmental referral from our fire marshal, date of submission, March 4th, 2021. Memorandum from our environmental planner, dated July 29th, 2021. Memorandum from our Department of Engineering, dated July 30th, 2021. Correspondence from Hallisey Pearson, Pearson and Cassidy, excuse me, dated August 4th, 2021. Memorandum from Aaron O'Hare, Environmental Planner, dated August 6th, 2021. And a site plan and wetlands application Received August 5th, 2021. Oh. And email correspondence from Allison Kapuscinski, dated August 9th, 2021. Thank you, Mr. Allison. If the applicant and or its representative would uh, introduce themselves and begin their presentation. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for your record, my name is Dennis Senaviva. I'm an attorney with the Senaviva Law Firm. I represent the owner and the applicant. Uh, with me in the audience is John Orsini, who's the sole member of uh, that LLC. To my immediate right, Mr. Chairman, is Jim Cassidy, who's the project engineer from Hallisey, Pearson, and Cassidy, making the majority of the presentation this evening. And also we have to his right, Matt Baldino, who is the traffic engineer from Solly Engineering to explain our traffic impact assessment. I'm going to give you an overview as I do normally, Mr. Chairman, just tell you that the property is 46.45 uh, acres in size. It's an assemblage of several parcels from a previous subdivision approved in 2002 for Northrop Industrial Park. Uh, two cul-de-sacs were approved then as part of Northrop Industrial Park. The western cul-de-sac known as Northrop Industrial Park Road West has been developed and the buildings are currently occupied. This, proposed, uh, this proposal merges the easterly parcels and the easterly cul-de-sac into this one 46.45 acre parcel. It is all zoned IX. The assembled parcel is currently vacant. Now the applicant proposes tonight to develop the assembled site with one 250,000 square foot building be together with associated automobile and truck parking and drive aisles. And Mr. Cassidy will go through the particulars of the engineering design for this application. Now, since Wallingford does not provide water or sewer, sanitary sewer services in this area, uh, this plan before you calls for water service to be provided by the city of Meriden, as it has been provided for all of the buildings on Northrop Industrial Park Road West. The site also requires an on-site sewage disposal system, again, with no sanitary sewer out there. Uh, additionally, uh, the plan, as Jim will explain in greater detail, ensures that all of the parking and loading areas drain to the underground infiltration system prior to discharging to adjacent wetlands. I should note the applicant has received wetlands approval, and most recently, as uh, Mr. Allison pointed out in the uh, correspondence, there's a, as a, there is an administrative approval for a revision to the plan, which I'm going to talk about now. And that is, um, before I turn this over to Jim, I wanted to note that the applicant has proposed since the time of application a significant change to the original plan. If you have read, and I'm sure you have exhibit 402-21L, which is the um, response to peer review comments by Solly Engineering dated June 29th, you may have noted that the applicant now proposes to widen Northrop Road, the full distance of its frontage, which is about 850 feet to a width of 30 feet. So that area, and I'm sure you've read the, the comments, there was a concern about how the road narrows. Uh, the applicant proposes to widen the road uh, for that full 850 uh, linear foot distance to 30 feet. In addition, there's a proposal to regrade an existing crest in the road right around the area of our uh, entrance, about four and a half feet in order to improve sight lines, uh, which will be a significant benefit uh, to the site. Um, and, and perhaps uh, Matt will talk about the fact that this location uh, has, is subject to a, a grant, a proposal to review the, the whole Northrop Road uh, area, but this um, significant increase uh, in, in uh, road width is a, is a great benefit to that location. That activity, um, widening the road, put some of, put some grading within 50 foot of a wetlands. And so uh, we didn't have to go back to the wetlands commission. We did file for an administrative approval of that modest change, a very small area. And we received that late on Friday. So we're properly here before you, Mr. Chairman, with the wetlands approvals. Uh, last, I just want to point out, and again, Mr. Orsini is here to comment on this tonight. Staff had inquired into possible tenants for the proposed building. I will tell you that the other buildings built in Northrop Industrial Park Road West, other than the Best Buy building, John built before he had tenants, and that's his, that's his MO here. He has a tendency to build buildings. He's an he's a, uh, interesting gentleman. Uh, so he's building this. The anticipation is to find four or five tenants, similar to those occupying the western portion of Northrop Industrial Park. Uh, I have a letter from the broker, which I can submit as an exhibit, indicating that that's the sort of tenant they're looking for, and John is here to offer uh, answers to any questions you might have. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to send this over to Mr. Cassidy. He can make the formal part of the presentation. 
Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. For the record, my name is Jim Cassidy. I'm a professional engineer and principal with the firm of Halsey, Pearson & Cassidy. My office is located at 630 Main Street in Cromwell, Connecticut. As uh, Attorney Senevive had mentioned, uh, we're here tonight representing uh, 1070 North Farms Road, LLC. Uh, John Orsini is the member of um, 1070 North Farms Road, LLC. We're here before you uh, seeking approval um, for the development of the site uh, located at 1117 Northrop Road, and the second parcel is actually to Northrop Road Industrial Park East. Uh, we're seeking approval for the construction of a new 250,000 square foot uh, warehouse and distribution facility. A um, little bit about the existing site. Uh, the first slide up is an existing uh, photo, uh, aerial photo of the property. Uh, as Dennis had mentioned, the overall site outlined in yellow on this plan consists of about 46.45 acres. Uh, it is zoned uh, IX, uh, Industrial Expansion District. Uh, you'll notice there's actually two sections of frontage along Northrop Road. Uh, on this particular photo, uh, north is to your right, uh, so the top portion is the west, the bottom is the east. Uh, so the frontage along the westerly portion of Northrop Road uh, on the right-hand side uh, is about 940 feet, and then there's an additional sec section of frontage uh, down to the bottom or to the east, about 862 feet of frontage. Uh, it is abutted on the west or the upper portion um, by five other industrial properties. Uh, those are the properties that um, Dennis, or Attorney Senevive mentioned that Mr. Orsini owns. Uh, those are industrial buildings that are within the uh, Northrop Industrial Park Road uh, west uh, site. Uh, the very back one would be the best, the best by site. Uh, there is a uh, single residence uh, that is circumference to the property towards the center of the frontage, uh, and then off to the south or to the bottom, and off to the east uh, is uh, existing farmland. Um, you'll see a basically right through the center of the property. You're going to see a gray line with a gray square, uh, and then off to the bottom you see another gray square. Um, that area represents a uh, Helco right-of-way, it's 125-foot Helco right-of-way that traverses through the property in an east-west direction, so from the top down to the bottom. Uh, the, the, the one gray line you see going back up to North Road uh, is remnants of a temporary access drive that Helco had when they were making some improvements uh, to their infrastructure uh, within that easement on this property. Uh, but the Helco right-of-way basically traverses the property in an east-west direction. Um, the property grades, uh, I would say, are moderate. Uh, they tend to be at a grade of about 3 uh, to 10 percent. Uh, they basically are sloping in an east and west direction. Uh, there's a slight ridge uh, running in a southerly direction down the center of the uh, agricultural field you see in the upper portion of the property. And then from that uh, slight ridge, everything slopes off in an east and west direction. Uh, elevations on this property range from about uh, 365 at a high down to about 340 at the low. You'll see some teal color areas on the property. Uh, there are several wetlands on this site. Uh, those teal color areas or cyan color areas represent the wetlands. Um, both of those wetlands are flowing in a southerly direction, eventually discharging into Catlin Brook uh, off to the south. Uh, the area to the Sorry, the area off to the west or to the top on this property is about 5.9 acres, and then the area on the bottom, um, or I'd say more towards the bottom center, uh, is about 80 acres of wetlands. The property itself is not in a designated flood hazard zone. It's in a zone X. Uh, as Dennis had said, um, this property is actually um, derived of um, over the years from a, a subdivision. Uh, in your package, we had included kind of a history of the property. The plan in the upper right-hand corner, or sorry, upper left-hand corner, is the property or prior to it ever being subdivided. Uh, the upper portion of that map would be Northrop Road. Off on the far left would be North Farms Road. Uh, in 2002, in June of 2002, um, it was subdivided uh, into an industrial subdivision. Uh, the left-hand side of it, uh, there was five lots created, uh, one right at the corner of uh, North Farms Road and Northrop Road, and then the small cul-de-sac that comes down through that uh, left portion uh, is Northrop, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Northrop Farms Industrial Park West uh, 
uh, and there was four lots associated with that roadway. The area uh, with the heavier black line uh, around it is the property that we're talking about this evening. Uh, that property was actually subdivided into four lots. In addition to, uh, there was a proposed roadway uh, that would have been North Rope Industrial Park East. Uh, three of the lots would have been on that road, and then there would have been an additional lot off on North Rope Road on the far right-hand side. Uh, in May, on the bottom left corner, on May of 20, 2020, um, the property was can merged. I, excuse me, can Sorry. I just interrupt you for just sure. a second? You have a laser pointer or anything? It may be a lot easier I can to uh, follow this for everyone. Yeah, sure, actually, I can do it right on, right on the screen. I'm sorry about sure, that. Sure, that's yeah. fine. Thank yeah. you. So, again, uh, this upper left hand corner was the original property here. Um, in 2002, um, it was subdivided, this map here. Um, as I say, stated, uh, this portion here uh, was created and there was one lot here at the corner of uh, North Farms Road and Northrop Road. Uh, there was a cul-de-sac constructed here. Um, that's Northrop uh, Industrial Park West. Uh, and then there are four lots on that road. One, two, three, and four uh, lots on, on that road. Uh, those lots are all developed. Uh, the piece that we're talking about this evening uh, is this piece outlined in the heavy black line here. On that piece of property, there was four lots created. In addition to, uh, there was Northrop um, Farm Industrial Park East. Uh, there was a right-of-way um, for that road located here. Uh, there are three lots that faced uh, that roadway, and then there was an exist another lot that would face North Farms Road. Uh, and I'm sorry, North, Northrop Road, sorry. Um, this is such time uh, in May of 2002. Um, they went back and they actually recombined, re, uh, merged all the properties together, basically creating it into two lots. Uh, you have one lot here, which has the majority of the frontage on Northrop uh, Road. Uh, the address of that property is actually uh, to uh, Northrop Industrial Park East, and then you had the remaining property here uh, that's actually the 1170 Northrop Road. As part of this application, uh, we're proposing to combine everything back together, uh, so we have one contiguous property uh, outlined uh, in red here. So th that's what we're here before you tonight for that piece of property consisting of the 46 acres altogether, 46.45. Um, the proposal, uh, as mentioned, uh, was to develop the property uh, with a new warehouse distribution facility. Uh, the building, uh, shown as the light brown rectangle in here, uh, has a total floor area of 250,000 square feet. Um, of that, we're proposing about 7,500 feet, feet of it would be office, uh, and then the remaining portion would be the warehouse and uh, distribution facility. Uh, access to the site uh, would be off Northrop Road, which is here. Uh, we're proposing to bring a single access drive in here uh, at the high point. Uh, this would provide access in, uh, single lane in. Uh, there would be an island separating, sorry. There would be an island separating. There's an island separating the in lane and then there will be two outbound lanes. One will be a right turn, one will be a left turn. Um, this driveway would circumference the entire building. Um, if you were to go to the east or to the upper portion, uh, this provides access uh, to a loading area where tractor trailers would be able to back up. So this portion here uh, would be the loading area where tractor trailers can back up. There's a total of 45 loading spaces uh, in, in that area there. Uh, if you were to continue around, you would cross back under uh, the CLMP or Helco easement. Uh, there'd be some additional trailer spaces uh, for storage to the rear. Um, and then the driveway would continue down along the east side of the building, connecting with the main access drive. Uh, off of these driveways, <laughs> off of these driveways, there's going to be three parking areas. Uh, there's a parking area to the front or to the uh, north of the building. There's an additional parking area off to the east uh, on the bottom portion of the page, and then there's another small parking area to the rear of the south of the building. We tried to divide up the parking uh, because, as was mentioned, uh, we're possibly looking at getting multiple tenants in this building. 
Uh, the building is right presently set up for about three tenants, uh, so it would probably be a split of about 50000 100000 100000 is what we're prospectively looking at at this point. <clears throat> we have a total of 109 parking spaces, or sorry, 209 parking spaces on this site. Um, per year zoning requirements, um, we are required for a distribution use, required to provide one space per every 1,500 square feet, uh, which requires a total of 167 spaces. Based upon prospective tenants' needs uh, for the, uh, what we're looking for for this building, uh, we felt that uh, about 209 uh, would be appropriate based upon other users that we've been talking to uh, for this building. Next photo is just the site plan overlaid uh, onto the aerial photo to get and give you a context of where it is in relation to everything else. Uh, so it's located more towards the west side of the property, up near the other industrial buildings. Uh, it is situated in between the wetlands area. As Dennis had mentioned, uh, we did receive wetlands approval uh, for the project. Uh, we are proposing no direct impacts to the wetlands associated with this project. Uh, in addition to on this plan, uh, you'll notice two uh, darker blue areas. Uh, we have an extensive stormwater management system as part of this project. Go to one more screen. Temperamental tonight, I'm sorry. Um, what we have, sorry. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, it's going in the wrong direction. Sorry, it's kind of mind of its own tonight. Not even touching it. Stop. Excuse me a second here. I don't, don't know why he wants to do this. Um, as I mentioned, um, we have an extensive stormwater management plan. Um, part of this plan, uh, we have um, two uh, surface detention basins. Uh, the dark blue area to the front of the uh, property is our first uh, stormwater basin. Uh, it's an infiltration basin. Uh, it will basically be a small depression. Uh, there will be a lawn area. Uh, it is not a wet bottom basin, so it will be maintained as a lawn. Uh, to the rear, um, there's also another detention basin on the far south. Uh, located here. Um, and then uh, this is another basin that picks up a portion of the drive area. Uh, as Dennis had mentioned, uh, you'll see two blue rectangles underneath the parking lot. Uh, those are two underground infiltration systems. Uh, the one to the upper portion or up to the east uh, is a system uh, that picks up the majority of the roof leaders from the building. Uh, the one smaller one uh, to the bottom uh, picks up the front portion of the building, the roof leaders for the front portion of the building. Uh, we did build an extensive stormwater model and report as part of this project. Uh, we find uh, is that post-development with all the stormwater measures in place uh, that you should see no increase in flows uh, as it discharges uh, down off the south end of the property or the left end of the pro property uh, towards Catlin Brook. Uh, in addition to, these systems are designed to uh, treat what we call the first inch of runoff or first flush of runoff. Uh, the first flush of runoff would typically clear, carries your pollutants, um, such as um, salt and sand that's used uh, for a winter application or winter ice melt, uh, and any oils that may drip out of vehicles uh, is treated um, before it's allowed to discharge onto the adjoining wetlands area.
So as I mentioned, I'm not gonna bore you with all the drainage, but uh, quickly, this is just a uh, post-development drainage area map. Um, the green area is going to the underground infiltration system off on the upper portion of the property. The blue area is going to the smaller underground system underneath the, pro the parking lot on the east or the lower portion of the parking lot. Uh, all the orange area goes to the stormwater basin out to the front of the property and all the yellow area is discharging off to the stormwater basin out to the rear of the property. Um, typical cross sections of the basins themselves. Uh, what will happen um, is this is a cross section through the basin. So your far uh, left side is where the pipe is entering. Uh, the darker blue uh, area is the volume of water uh, that would be in the bottom of the basin that's allowed to infiltrate back into the ground. The light blue area is the area that would be able to discharge through our outlet structure. Uh, from our outlet structure, it discharges through an outlet pipe and then onto the adjoining wetlands. Um, so that, that darker blue area is the water that we're treating in the bottom of the basin for stormwater quality. Um, as Dennis had mentioned, um, as part of this project, uh, we are proposing some improvements to Northrop Road. Um, this is our frontage along Northrop Road. Um, the upper portion here is our access driveway. Um, what we're looking at doing uh, is basically reconstructing a portion of Northrop Road from here. If anybody's been out there, uh, you would see an existing gravel access drive. That's that, that access drive that I showed you that CLMP was using. So about 100 feet prior to that, um, you, that's where we're gonna actually start our road improvement. Uh, the overall improvement goes about 900 feet ending in this location here. Uh, two things are gonna happen. Uh, the majority of that section of the road is about 24 feet wide right now. Um, we're gonna be widening it uh, about 800 feet of it uh, to about 30 feet wide. Uh, the first 100 feet would be a taper uh, from the existing width of the road up to that 30 feet wide. So this section here is going to be your tapered section of roadway. Uh, in addition to, uh, if anyone's drove in, driven through there, um, what you'll notice is there's a vertical crest. Uh, the vertical crest obstructs the sight line. Uh, so on this plan, the green line up on the top is the existing grade along the profile of the road. Uh, as Dennis had mentioned, uh, when we do our work, we're gonna actually drop the grade, drop that crest in the road approximately three to four feet, which represents that um, red line. Um, not only does it improve the sight line for our site access driveway, but if anyone's driving along there, uh, there's a little bit of a, a blind spot as you come over the hump. Uh, and I'm sure Matt will, uh, will talk to a bit a little bit uh, about how it helps improve the sight line as you go along Northrop Road. Um, in addition to in that area, uh, as, uh, um, Dennis had mentioned, we'll be extending the water main uh, down through that section. So we figured that's a good opportunity to do this improvement, um, to make this improvement, seeing we have to rip up the road uh, and allow us to regrade it and make this improvement all at the same time. Um, as part of our original submission, uh, we did submit a, a sight line demonstration plan. Uh, on this plan, the blue lines on the profile on the bottom represent a tractor trailer, uh, what would be required, uh, which is about 740 feet of sight line. So this is the original design, uh, and you can see uh, with that blue line, there was no ground uh, in the profile uh, obstructing it. Uh, the green line below it represents uh, the sight line required uh, for a passenger vehicle. Uh, for a passenger vehicle looking off in the eastbound direction, I believe we need a total of 463 for a design speed of 42 miles an hour, and then looking off to the west, we need a total of 507. Um, we were able to achieve it with the original design, um, but we did have to do some regrading of the shoulder, um, which is in this area here. Um, fast forward, um, now we have actually are proposing to repave the roadway, or widen the roadway, and drop the grade. Um, so the whole cross edge area on this plan uh, is actually getting dropped. So all it does is for a site drive makes the uh, site distance actually that much more better. Um, that whole cross edge area is coming out. So we have more than adequate sight line uh, for this proposed development for both tractor trailers and passenger vehicles. Uh, we did submit an extensive, extensive uh, erosion and sediment control plan as part of the application. It was reviewed by the Wetlands Commission um, just so everyone's aware, what will happen is the, um, the 
DNS measures will be handled in two phases. Uh, there is a phase one which deals with the initial grading, uh, then the actual development which is phase two. Uh, there will be an ENS plan associated with that also. Um, we also submitted a landscaping plan as part of the package. Um, we did go through all the requirements of the landscaping regulations and found that we meet and exceed. Uh, we'll be planting a series of street trees along the entire frontage at about intervals of about every 50 feet. Uh, there are about 15 islands within the parking lot that will also have some canopy trees in it. Uh, then there'll be foundation plantings, and plantings along the entire frontage also. Um, so we believe we meet and exceed all the requirements of the landscaping regulations also. Uh, we also did um, submit a site photometrics plan, um, which is this plan I have up here. All the red dots on the plan represent the location of the light fixtures uh, that will be around the site. Uh, there will be poles on a concrete base. The poles will be at a height of 25 feet. And then there will be wall-mounted lights uh, on the building also. Um, based upon the calculations we prepared for this, uh, and one of the beauties of this is we're so far from the property lines um, that we have no spillage of light onto adjoining properties. All the light fixtures will be dark scar compliant, high of energy efficient uh, LED fixtures also. Uh, this is a floor plan for the building. Uh, as mentioned, presently it's broken up into three spaces. Um, so right now it's broken up into 100,000, 100,000 square foot space, and then a 50,000 square foot space at the end for the total of 250. As I mentioned, there's a total of 7,500 square feet of office, so each area has about a 2,500 square foot office uh, within it presently. Um, BL companies had prepared a uh, rendering of the proposed building. Uh, this would be the site that you would face as you come up Northrop Road, headed in a westerly direction. The overall building height is going to be 40 feet. Uh, it is a, a steel building. Uh, it's very similar to all the other buildings that Mr. Orsini has built in his office park or in his industrial park off to the west. Uh, there will be storefront glass on the office portion of it. You will notice some windows in the upper section. There are no, there is no second floor in the building. Uh, that is just to let natural light into the warehouse space uh, that's beyond. Um, but this is a preliminary plan of the building that is proposed for this uh, site. Uh, and then we also have a couple uh, renderings uh, for the proposed building to give you a, a feel for what this building will look like. So this would be the front right corner of the building as you approach it from uh, Northrop Road. Uh, again, the overall building height is about 40 feet. So I just want to go back uh, one slide. Hopefully I still have it in here and it won't be as temperamental this time. He doesn't like the photos. Um, so zoning requirements. So as part of the package, uh, we obviously provided a uh, zoning table. Um, that's what I'm trying to get to here. There we go.
So um, this is what I was trying to get to. So this is the overall zoning table that's provided in the plan. I just like to usually like to go over briefly just to make sure everyone's so, you know where those zoning requirements and how we comply with everything. Uh, in this particular case, we easily meet and exceed all the different requirements. Um, we, again, we are in the IX uh, zone. Uh, your minimum lot area for the IX zone is 217,000 square feet. We're almost 10 times that. We're over 2,023,000 uh, 20, square feet. Frontage requirements 250. Uh, we're at 939.25 just for the westerly most portion. That doesn't even include the eastern portion. Uh, front yard setback uh, is another thing I wanted to go through. Um, the typical front yard setback requirement is 60 feet. Um, that's for a building with 30 feet in height. Uh, you're allowed to go up the higher building up to 40 feet, which we are proposing, uh, but we need to add five feet for every additional one foot uh, building height. So in this particular case, we need to be 110 feet from the road. Our closest point is 118.58. Uh, side yards, 30 feet on each side. Um, we're at 205 uh, to the east, and we're at 165.3. I'm sorry, 295, 200.95 to the west, and then 165.32 to the east. Rear yard, um, again, we have a Helco right away. It keeps us pretty far from that rear yard. We need to have 50 feet minimum. Uh, we're at 770.91. The building height uh, is allowed to be 30 with up to 40 with the increased uh, front yard setback. Um, so we're at 40 feet with this proposal. Building coverage, uh, we're allowed to be at 25. Uh, we're at 12.36%, so we're only halfway uh, to or about half of what's actually allowed. Uh, open space, uh, this is a minimum requirement. We need to provide a minimum of 35%. Uh, presently, we have 75.06. Uh, as I mentioned with parking, um, based upon the warehouse distribution use, the parking ratio is one space per 1,500 square feet of gross floor area. Um, we have a 250,000 square feet requiring 167 spaces. Uh, we are requesting to have uh, 209, nine of which would be handicapped spaces so that are evenly distributed throughout the site. Uh, within the parking lot itself, uh, we are required to have uh, landscape islands. Um, this table based, was based upon our original proposal where we had 250 spaces, uh, which required uh, one sp or sorry, 10 square foot for each space for a total of 2,500 square feet. Uh, I did not change the table. Uh, we are providing 2,630. Uh, so actually, at this point, based upon the reduced number of parking spaces, we only need 2,090, uh, but we still meet and well exceed the overall requirement. Uh, and the final requirement was loading spaces. Um, we are required to have one space uh, for the first 2,500 uh, square feet, I'm sorry, uh, from 25 to 4,900 square feet, and then one additional space for every 2,500 square feet there above. Uh, so based upon our calculations, uh, we need a total of 11 loading spaces. Uh, we're at 45 loading spaces altogether. So I think we uh, meet and exceed all the requirements of the zoning regulations. Um, I will note uh, that we did receive staff comments uh, from planning, engineering. Um, we've addressed hopefully all the staff comments at this point. Uh, I did provide some re uh, review letters or uh, response letters to each one of those comments. Uh, and if need be, I can go over those uh, with the commission. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Matt. Hopefully he has a little better luck uh, with his portion of the presentation. Um, I think it's because it's just warm in here. It's being a little temperamental. Good evening, Commission members. Uh, for the record, my name is Matt Baldino again uh, with Soli Engineering, office located at 501 Main Street in Monroe, Connecticut. Uh, Soli Engineering completed a traffic impact assessment for the proposed development, uh, which analyzed uh, the adjacent roadway network and four um, intersections, three of which are signalized um, in accordance with all of the Town of Wallingford requirements as well as standard traffic engineering methodology. Just to kind of orient everyone here, um, the Three intersections located on the bottom uh, of your screen there uh, were the study area intersections which are signalized, which the three 
three intersections located down there uh, are the intersections of Route 68. Uh, the first one over to your left there is Barnes Road, Route 68, and Northrop Road, which extends down towards our property up to the north, as well as the intersection of Miles Drive down to the south. The other two intersections are the intersections with uh, Barnes Road, Route 68, and the Interstate 91 northbound and southbound ramps. For any traffic study, the first thing we, we want to look at is the existing conditions, and to do that, we collected journey movement count data during September of 2020, then coordinated with CTDOT to adjust based on the travel patterns uh, reflective of as those counts were conducted during COVID to adjust those to pre-COVID conditions to establish a baseline of the conditions that are out there today. Um, once establishing the existing conditions, we then want to look at the conditions of the roadway in the future year of which the development will be completed. And to do that, we assumed a 1% gra grade uh, throughout that time, as well as included the traffic associated with nearby developments located at Five Research Parkway, uh, which was on the agenda earlier today, as well as the development associated with 850 Murdoch Avenue, uh, which is located just north of our site here today. Once analyzing that, the existing conditions and then establishing the background conditions, we then look at the uh, trips to be generated by the proposed development. To do this, we used data published by the Institute of Transportation Engineers ITE Trip Generation Manual in accordance with all standard traffic engineering methodology. Based on the proposed warehouse distribution center, the proposed uh, trips to be generated by the proposed development is 43 new trips during the AM peak hour and 48 new trips during the p.m. peak hour. The peak hour of the adjacent street traffic occurred between 7.15 and 8.15 in the weekday morning, then at 4.15 to 5.15 during the weekday evening peak hours. Again, those are the peak hours of the adjacent street traffic along Barnes Road, um, as those were the uh, greatest potential for impact, so this was the study period. Typically, a traffic study is conducted whenever the, with guidance from the DOT, with wherever a Development is anticipated to generate 100 or more new trips at any of the signalized uh, intersections. So as you can see, we're well below, below 50 trips during the peak hours of the adjacent street traffic. Um, however, we did complete this traffic study as well to provide additional analysis of the roadway network. As mentioned, uh, the proposed development um, as mentioned, these intersections are located on a state route, and um, due to the size of this development, a permit will be required from the Office of Street Traffic Authority, um, an o OSTA permit, which will then review the um, traffic associated with this development and look at those adjacent signalized intersections down to the south. Uh, however, with our traffic study, we did note that there is um, no additional roadway improvements that are required uh, to accommodate the proposed traffic associated with this development. And as uh, Jim mentioned earlier, uh, the proposed development does include widening along Northrop Road in the vicinity of the project to accommodate, to increase the sight lines, as well as to allow for truck circulation into and outside of the site. We have received comments from SLR, um, in which we have provided a written response to those comments addressing um, all of those items uh, with them prior to this evening's meeting. Um, with that, I will pass the presentation back to Jim Cassidy, and I'm happy to answer any questions regarding the traffic associated with this project. I think I'll take that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that's basically the presentation. I know that you have your, uh, the town has retained an independent peer reviewer of the traffic. I know they're here tonight. Uh, they were, again, kind enough to provide a, 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 an assessment, a peer review for the, for the commission that's been shared with us. And, I, and again, Sally Engineering has responded to that. The primary um, benefit, if you will, Mr. Chair, is the fact that this plan does have the widening of um, Northrop Road along that frontage, which I think is a substantial improvement along with reducing that crest in the road. So I just wanted to read, because I, I had mentioned it, I forgot to offer it as an exhibit. We have a letter from CB... RE, it's um, the realtor handling the leasing of this site for Mr. Orsini. And it's a letter dated July 26th. I will offer it, Mr. Chair. It just says that 
it's the intent as the leasing agent uh, to focus our attention on attracting classic warehouse users looking to locate in the center of the state and he acknowledges that acknowledges they have uh, Best Buy warehouse, they have Goodyear Tire, uh, Court Business Services, the sort of, he calls them clean warehouse users that require normal auto and trailer parking. So uh, that's the sort of tenant. Mr. Orsini is here to answer any questions that the Commission may have. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I think we're complete with our presentation. Good enough. Thank you very much. Uh, before I uh, go to Commission members and, uh, and our staff, uh, I believe we have a representative from SL, SLR uh, here. Is that correct? Is it Mr. Sullivan or some other individual? I'm not David sir. Sullivan. Excuse me, sir. If you'd like to, you could either stand or if you'd like to sit at the at the, uh, at the, uh, at the table to my right, uh, you're certainly welcome to do that too. There's a microphone there. If you just please turn it on. My name is Carl Giordano from SLR. Um, I'm here with my colleague, Neil Olinsky. Uh, Dave Sullivan couldn't be here tonight, so we're in his place. Um, so we were asked by the town to do the peer review, uh, as mentioned, um, and we provided 16 comments um, to Soli, and by and large, they were, um, for the vast majority, um, addressed and taken care of or the other ones were not very consequential. Um, the big items have been discussed, um, such as uh, one of the comments that we provided were concerns with the sight lines, and uh, to that response, um, Solly and the civil engineer provided the sight line plan and profile, uh, showing that the sight lines will be sufficient um, with the proposed regrading. Um, another major comment um, worth discussing was, um, was the matter of the traffic studies uh, treating of the proposed development as a traditional warehouse. And it looks like by discussion um, that the uh, applicant has discussed um, with potential tenants or um, certain uses that are consistent with the traditional warehouse use that was assumed in the study. So we felt that that was sufficiently addressed as well. Uh, vehicle tracking uh, diagrams were also provided. Um, we, had, we had commented that uh, there were concerns with truck turns and that um, it should be shown that the trucks should be able to sufficiently turn safely, and uh, w WB67 truck turn diagrams were provided. Um, and as discussed with the widening along the side frontage to 30 feet, the turning radii were shown to be sufficient. And in the site plan, it was shown that a mountable turning radius was added, um, further uh, improving turning for truck maneuverability. Um, Another comment that we had made was um, the potential for spot improvements along North Up Road, uh, noting the, uh, the narrow widths at um, several points along the roadway. And um, it looks like the SCROG uh, study has been initiated that will further study on those uh, other areas that are not along the site frontage and uh, will be addressed in that study. Um, so we felt that that response was sufficient as well. Um, I believe the last comment note uh, worth noting uh, was uh, in regard to uh, intersection traffic operations at the city intersections. Um, and, and while uh, for the most part the development looks like it would not have a, a notable impact on traffic operations, there were one or two locations where um, there were a level of service uh, degradation 
degradations, um, level of service being uh, a measure of uh, quality of traffic operations. Um, in one location, there was uh, a movement at Barnes Road at the I-91 northbound ramps. The eastbound left movement did uh, degrade from a level of service E to F. Um, there was one other location that, um, that did degrade from level of service D to E at um, the Barnes Road, Northrop Road, eastbound left turn. Um, the other uh, the other locations uh, were inconsequential um, to overall traffic operations at those locations. Um, that summarizes my comments. Um, feel that the rest of the comments were, were very sufficient. Thank you. Could you go into a little bit when you mentioned there was a degradation of a couple of the uh, intersections? Could you go into into that? Uh, Sure. A little bit more uh, specifically, and just if there was any response or from the applicant as far as how to address that. So, sure. What I was referencing was um, the 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 worst uh, the worst one that I mentioned was at um, Barnes Road at the I ninety one northbound ramps, the uh, eastbound left turn onto uh, onto the ramp. Uh, that left turn movement was shown in the appendix materials to uh, degrade from a level of service E to F. Um, it did look like there were some. Um, could you, excuse me, could you say that it was the, the northbound, it was the left turn, so heading west, is that correct? The eastbound. So it was, it was a northbound ramp? Correct. So if it's a north, if it's a northbound ramp, if you're going east, you'd make a right, wouldn't you? Northbound on ramp, going eastbound, turning left onto the northbound on ramp. Yeah, I, b I believe on the, the easternmost intersection circled, uh, that left turn movement there. Um, getting on. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Correct. That was the most significant uh, impact to uh, any movement, traffic movement that we uh, we saw in there. And uh, like I mentioned, the other one noteworthy location was Barnes Road at Northrop Road, eastbound left turn there. Um, not quite as as poor level of service, but uh, with the uh, proposed development, it did show um, level of service D to E. Um, and uh, we just wanted to uh, to note that. Um, <coughs> If there were any sort of improvements that could be potentially made with the signal timings, um, you know, there's always the possibility that it could be improved and uh, fixed. Uh, so it's it doesn't show that. Um, that wondering if that was uh, something that could have been looked into. Thank you. Any commission members with uh, questions for our uh, peer reviewer, Mr. Cohen? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I really have uh, just uh, one question on the, uh, the traffic as far as, um, <clears throat> you know, they mentioned 43 a.m. Uh, trips, 48 p.m. trips. Um, are those cars, are those trucks, are those combination? Um, those were the com a combination. Um, I would, would you like to? Yes. <laughs> and, and you know, can you break it down a little farther as far as, you know, specifics? Um, I don't have the specifics, but I can def we can definitely provide that information. Um, it is assumed that uh, the truck percentage is actually pretty low during the peak hour of the adjacent street traffic. Typically, most of those, again, trucks kind of don't want to be on the roadway at those times. Right. So, um, it is assumed, though, that all of the truck traffic um, exiting the site will exit right out of the site. Um, towards the highway ramps. Uh, the truck percentages were uh, adjusted during the build condition to reflect the, an additional um, truck uh, volume on the roadway network. Okay. That was it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Other commission members? Mr. Hine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
questions I have, I think, are primarily um, meant for uh, Mr. Giordano. Uh, you, you said that the uh, 91 um, northbound on-ramp heading eastbound on, on Barnes Road went from a level of service um, E to F. Uh, in layman's terms, what does that mean? I mean, sure. what's the everyday effect of that? Um, so that kind of correlates to uh, an amount of delay or uh, inconvenience that a driver uh, experiences uh, at the light waiting to, to make that turn for the, for the traffic signal. Um, so I, I think there was a, I think the appendix material showed a, a degree of maybe 10 or 12 seconds of increase at that movement. Um, and a kind of, and the corresponding delay corresponds to a certain category and in le level of service. And it was, without the development it showed, it was level service E, and then those additional seconds of delay and driver uh, uh, inconvenience uh, pushed it to the threshold of level service F. Um, so that's, it's just a, it's a higher category of uh, driver delay. Okay, and then, um, you know, in school, I, uh, you know, I always thought of, uh, you know, any, any grade below a, a C as being unacceptable um, or undesirable. Uh, can you tell me, uh, I mean, do the, grade, the level of service grades kind of work the same way here? Um, in a way. Um, typically, level of service D and in, in some cases E is, is uh, considered acceptable. Um, typically, A to D is uh, the range that you look for. E can be okay. And, and F is uh, kind of an area that we would want to look at, seeing if there's room for improvement. Um, okay, I, so on that note, I can provide a little more context there. Um, so we are showing an increase of 11.8 seconds of delay on that individual left turn movement, but I did want to want to kind of bring to everyone's attention also um, in the revised material that we did submit, uh, those, that does account for, it was, um, we were given the direction to also account for the trips associated with Five Research Parkway, and one of those um, improvements associated with that development was actually the uh, restriping of the off ramp to provide. Um, right now, it is dual lefts with a right turn lane. Um, as part of that, those improvements, they were going to restripe that to provide one exclusive left, and then the middle lane would be left and right turn. Um, and then there would also be a right turn lane. Uh, so, so some of the increase in delay that is experienced there is, is that lane is now also serving as the right turn lane as well um, in that condition. Uh, in the background in the build, it is reflective of, of the improvements as well. Um, but this is something that we will definitely look at with the um, DOT as we permit it through the OSDA. Uh, they will review all of the uh, materials as part of that application and look at the, the timing of improvements associated um, as necessary. Thank you. Um, and then, uh, Mr. Bal Baldini is? Baldino. Oh, Baldino. Um, there was, you mentioned, um, you know, some of the um, changes in timing and stuff for the lights. Did you, did you yourself or your firm um, actually take a look at um, changing the timing on any of those lights or do any of those computations? Um, that's something we can look into further. There's, there's um, some timing operations that can be, can be made to adjust um, the, that, specific, that specific individual movement. Um, but I did want to note that the overall intersection is only increasing in less than three seconds of delay experienced by all drivers at that intersection. So, so with those improvements, we can, we can look at improving that specific movement off the ramps, and that is definitely something the DOT will look at as that is an exit off of the state highway. 
Okay, but just to be clear, you haven't looked at that. We yet. have not identified any specific improvements at this time for that. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. And then um, back to Mr. Giordano. Um, at the end of um, the applicant's traffic study, there is a statement that is made Um, actually, the, the second to last sentence says, there is no indication that the proposed development will have an adverse impact on the roadway network. Is that something that you, um, as a peer reviewer, having reviewed their um, submission and their study, is that a statement that you agree with? Yeah, so when we, when we make those statements, um, it's, it's what Matt was describing, that uh, looking at the overall um, intersection, looking at the overall approaches, um, what that, those one or two spots um, wouldn't necessarily make uh, us decide that, you know, there is an adverse impact um, if there's a way that we can improve it. So that, so that is just kind of a spot um, where we would like to see if there is something that can make it a little bit better. But, um, overall, um, it wouldn't be an adverse impact. Okay, would it be fair to say that you have um, a couple areas that you think they can be improved, but overall no adverse impact as a result of this development? Yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, like I said, uh, if, the, if that uh, those one or two locations uh, could be tweaked with uh, the, while uh, going through the process with DOT. Um, that that would be ideal. The last uh, set of questions I have is: Do you have any concern um, that some of these intersections are already operating at a D to E? Um, level of service, um, and then you're adding on a, you know, another warehouse uh, with some, um, I hesitate to say significant because it's, it's less than 100 uh, peak hour uh, trips. But um, do you have any concern as to adding this traffic to intersections that are already operating at the D to E level? Um, so, uh, it, it's with the, uh, so the way that the analysis is done is, uh, there's an existing conditions and then there's a background conditions where, um, the other projects, um, at Five Research Parkway and, uh, the Murdoch Avenue were added onto that. And, um, that's the second scenario. And then the third scenario is with the proposed, proposed pro project, um, and those each have kind of a bit by bit impact on uh, the intersections. Um, you know, it, it's it's tough to say. You know, what, is it is it going to? It, it wouldn't be uh, correct to say that it would it would like break an intersection. Um, uh, these are, tend to be conservative analyses. Um, so, um, based on what we've looked at. Um, those one or two spots are the real, only real uh, room for improvement areas. Um, and that's what I, what I would have to say for that. Okay. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Before I go to other commission members, just to you know, pick up uh, when you were talking about the extended delay uh, on the, uh, for, the northbound, uh, for the northbound ramp, does that impact at all the stacking the queuing? The, yeah, the queuing on the, uh, on 68. Um, that's not something that we looked into. Um, I can't really comment to that. Sure, I guess perhaps the applicant could, uh, I'm not sure what the, you know, what the, uh, the length is of that, uh, you know, of, of the, uh, the stacking for that, uh, for that turn. 
So just to make sure we're on the same page here, so the between the two signalized intersections to the interstate ramps, correct? Yeah, what I, well, what I'm looking at is just at the light, that, uh, the light at the uh, northbound ramp, because that's the intersection that we're talking about that has, uh, that's, the delay is changing. And so just my question is, with that delay, does that cause any problem with traffic that's waiting to make the left turn onto 91 North? So these intersections actually operate on a coordinated network, meaning that they all kind of interact with one another on the roadway network. So the, the queuing associated with the um, easternmost intersection there um, is, is con also controlled by the intersections before it. Um, so we, we did look at the, the queuing associated with that, but the queuing um, at that intersection and that eastbound approach um, is, is metered by the intersections prior to it as well. So, so any, um, I don't have the exact numbers of any increase, uh, but that is something we can, we can look into. But again, it's really controlled by the intersections upstream as well. So is your answer, you're not sure, yes or no? Again, so it's, since it's metered, it's, it's again, the, the impact kind of from the intersection before it. Um, I, let me just see, I think we have the numbers here specifically at that approach and the eastbound approach. Do you know what the queuing lane is for the uh, for that left turn? The length? So there's about 640 feet on the eastbound approach. Pretty much extends back to the intersection prior. And so, yeah, the, the queuing under the existing conditions can, extends on the eastbound approach through to the other intersection through the whole full 640 feet in both the no build condition as well as the um, build condition. Um, then the queuing on the southbound approach, um, we did discuss that as uh, there is a minor increase in, in queue on that approach as well, um, kind of carrying back. Um, no, again, I understand that, but I don't have. A I, but I'm not, I, yeah, I, I, no. I, yes, that, that's what I should drive. You don't have a specific answer, though. Is that correct? I do not have the specific queue increase, but we can okay. provide that information to you. Okay, I appreciate that. All right, moving on to other commission members with questions. Uh, anyone else? Yes, Mr. Allen's. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, quick question for Mr. Giordano. Um, I'm looking at. It's our exhibit marked 402-21L. It's the uh, response to your comments from uh, Soli Engineering. Um, I'm specifically looking at, uh, it looks like response 14 where it talks about capacity analysis, which is what I think some of the questions have been going on about. And it seems to rely on data that may or may not occur from another build, which is reliant on the state of Connecticut, on OSTA applications, et cetera, et cetera. So I think you, you went into a significant amount as far as what would occur if the state did everything that all applicants want them to do. What if they do nothing? Sorry, could you re rephrase that? I, I don't understand. So, if the state not, does nothing? If the state makes no improvements in the intersection area, what would that do to the traffic? How far would it degradate? Because it seems that your numbers here and the comments back and forth have included if the improvements occurred, but I didn't see the data if they did not occur. At the, are you looking specifically at the signalized intersections? Comment number 14 says, during the PM peak hour at the I-91 north, northbound ramps intersection, the westbound through movement worsens mm -hmm. from LOS-E to LOS-F, an increase in 15 to 20 seconds of delay. Mm -hmm. However, a degradation in LOS of this scale seems high with only 16 total, total site trips. 
and then it goes on to say synchro output sheets should be provided. The response from Soli Engineering says traffic assessment has been revised to include the traffic value, volumes and signal improvements associated with the proposed five research parkway project. And then goes on to provide data regarding those improvements. What I'm asking is both of your comments seem to include the data from the five research parkway improvements, which would be OSTA improvements. If those did not occur, where would that put us? Um, so, yeah, I did, looking through the, uh, the analysis, uh, the, like you mentioned, the five research parkway, um, signal timings, timing improvements associated with that uh, looks like they were implemented, which um, included some cycle length adjustments and maybe some split adjustments. Um, a little bit technical, but um, I, I guess Matt may be able to, to speak to this a little bit better, but um, this, I guess this analysis assumes the most conservative scenario where the traffic associated with that five research parkway development um, and the mitigation with that um, is, is uh, carried through the uh, scenarios we're comparing. Um. On that note, um, so I just want to clarify. So to the traffic study dated March 3rd, which was originally submitted, did not include the traffic associated with Research Parkway. Um, so we did show that there was no adverse impact to the roadway network. Without the traffic, as well as the roadway improvements associated with the five research um, parkway, that did still include um, the traffic associated with 850 Murdoch Avenue, which was already approved um, and un under construction. Um, so we, we did demonstrate kind of both avenues um, with and without the trips associated with the five research. The most recent submission did include those trips to provide a conservative analysis. Um, while, while we were discussing, I did look into the queue length of the eastbound approach. Um, again, like I said, because it is metered by the other intersection, um, the queue length is controlled ultimately by that, that intersection. Uh, so the queue length only increases uh, from 457 feet to 477 feet, only a two foot increase um, associated with that. And uh, to clarify what I had previously mentioned, again, it is metered by the other one, so it is controlled by it, but it does not extend through the 640 feet of queue that is actually available there. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. And I just wanted to make sure <clears throat> I was reading the data correctly. Um, the other thing, Mr. Chairman, just for the record, um, I, I don't want any of my comments to be construed as, as a guess. We just don't know what the state's going to do. And that's all the only reason for my line of questioning. Thank you. I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Any other commission members? Okay, at this point in time, uh, Mr. Pagini, uh, any comments on the, uh, on the application? Uh, no, I have no further comments at this time. Uh, I think they've addressed uh, pretty much all of my concerns. So. Okay. Thank you. This is a public hearing. Uh, are there any members of the public that would like to speak on the application? Uh, any member of the public would like to speak on the application? Please come forward. State your name and uh, address and your comments. Seeing none, I'll uh, first bring it back to just any commission members if they've had any uh, final comments that they would like to make or actually final questions that they'd like to have for the applicant. And seeing none uh, as far as the applicant, uh, certainly the app, yes, Mr. Uh, Cohen. Yeah, I'll make a couple extra comments. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I, think, I think the project is a good project. I uh, do happen to uh, run by the site many times during the week, and uh, I know exactly how the road improvements are going to help me as a runner. Um, I will admit the truck drivers are pretty, pretty good over there, so I expect the same from this uh, development. Um, I do think that <clears throat> basically this is a a minimal uh, increase in traffic. Um, and I do think without the um, application on five research, you know, this, 
you know, <clears throat> would have really no impact. We really wouldn't be even talking about the traffic on this application. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's uh, just one of those odd circumstances where, um, you know, the combination of applications does make this um, difficult to um, figure out, quite frankly. And I, I will echo Mr. Allenson's comments where, you know, we're relying on OTSA to uh, make a lot of these improvements to uh, make things work. Um, but for your specific application, um, you know, I, I think it's got, got really minimal impact on on the traffic situation, and, it, and I would support it. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. I'd offer the uh, the applicant if you'd like to make any final comments on the application before I entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Certainly, you're not compelled to, but if you'd like to, feel free. I'll make it quick, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to point out, and I think it's to Commissioner Cohen's point. Um, you know, we were instructed to consider in the traffic study the the uh, impact of the Five Research Parkway, which is unusual, as this commission knows. Normally, we consider those projects that have already been approved and included in that analysis so that it does, um, at the end of the day, I think one of the comforts that we have for this project is A, it, it's not a large traffic generator, and B, um, there's going to be another set of eyes besides uh, our team, the peer review, it's got to go to DOT. So. Thank you. Thank you. I guess with that, if there's no further comments from commission members, the applicant, uh, Mr. Pagini, is uh, all set at this point in time. I'd. Uh, entertain a motion to close our public hearing. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to close the public hearing for application 402-21-1070 North Farms Road, LLC. We have a uh, second? Second. Second by Mr. Allison. Voting beginning with Mr. Cohan, please. Yes. Yes. Move down the road. Yes. Yes. And yes, uh, at this point in time, I would uh, entertain a motion on the application or if any commission members would like to make any comments prior to uh, voting on the application. Yes, at this point in time, I certainly uh, would echo Mr. Uh, Mr. Cohan's comments. Uh, I think as far as the, uh, the amount of traffic that's being generated to projected to be generated from this application is, you know, is rather, rather small. Certainly, I think it's a, a benefit as far as what the applicant's uh, doing, uh, as far as doing the road widening uh, as well as the roadway improvements as well as cutting down uh, on the uh, uh, on the, the slope on, on the road also uh, looking at some of the other uh, properties in that general area the warehouse properties that mr. Orsini has uh, you know has constructed certainly uh, I think those are uh, have been attractive properties and I would certainly expect this one to uh, to be the same uh, again any other commission members with any comments um, yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, before a motion, um, through you to Mr. Pagini, um, sure. should we require any type of, you know, construction uh, bond or any? Yes, that was like that? Uh, something I was going to bring up uh, because they currently have a special permit for excavation and fill right now. There's just some issues to be worked out whether we could transfer some of that bond to this project. So I think uh, something in the effect of, you know, the, the bond amount to be determined uh, at a later time. Okay, thank you. So at this point in time, if there's uh, no other comments from commission members, I'd entertain a motion on the application. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> I'd like to make a motion to approve application 402-21-1070 North Farms Road, LLC, special permit for 1070 North Farms Road, LLC, for a 250,000 square foot distribution warehouse and associated 209 parking spaces located at 1117 Northrop Road and 2 Northrop Industrial Park Road East, as shown on the plans entitled Proposed 250,000 Square Foot Warehouse Distribution Builded Building dated September 29th, 2020 and revised to August 5th, 2021, subject to the following conditions of approval. One, comments of town engineer Allison Kapuscinski to Planning and Zoning Commission dated 
July 30th, 2021, and April 28th, 2021. Comments of the fire marshal in interdepartmental referral dated 3-11-2021 and 7-2-2021. Comments of Eric Kruger, Senior Engineer, Water and Sewer Department, in inner office memorandum dated 4-8-2021. And property address of merged lots to be attained from the building department before final maps are submitted. And any permits, including zoning and special permits issued. Final plans with new address should also be accompanied with the new deed. And last, um, bond to be determined from previous uh, excavation uh, application. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. I, I think as far as the, the date, the revision date of the, uh, of the plans, I believe that should be August 4th. At least the plans I have showed revised August 4th, 2021. Yes, that's correct. So I, I think if we would make a correction on that, please. Okay, uh, amend the motion to uh, specify plan of August 4th instead of August 5th, 2021. Thank you. We have a motion on the application. Do we have a, uh, do we have a second? Second. Second by uh, Mr. Hine, voting beginning with Mr. Cohan. Yes. 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 And yes, your application has been approved. Have a good evening, gentlemen. Thank you. Brings us up to our next uh, order of business, which is a zoning tax amendment, uh, section 4.9B, uh, 10, and uh, section 6.11C, small animals, surgical services of Connecticut LLC. Again, Mr. Allenson, if you would please note all correspondence for the record, and if the applicant would please come forward to begin preparing for uh, his or her presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have a legal notice, number 50121. Zoning regulation text amendment for white to add section 4.9.B.13 and to modify section 6.11.C to the Wallingford zoning regulations to allow outpatient small animal surgical facilities as a permitted use in the industrial expansion IX district. We have an application for a zoning regulation change dated June 10th, 2021. We have correspondence from attorney Jim Laughlin dated July 30th, 2021. We have correspondence from Kevin Pagini, town planner dated July 14th, 2021. We have Correspondence from the South Central Connecticut Regional Planning Commission, signed by Jeffrey Cohen, dated July 12th, 2021. We have an interdepartmental referral from our senior engineer, date of submission, June 11th, 2021. We have an interdepartmental referral from our town engineer, date of submission, June 11th, 2021. And we have an interdepartmental referral from our fire marshal dated June 11th, 2021. And I believe that is all. Thank you, Mr. Allison. If the applicant and or its representative please introduce themselves and begin their presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Jim Lachlan, an attorney here in town. My office is on North Main Street in Wallingford. As you know already, this is a proposal to change the zoning regulation. It's a text amendment um, affecting the IX zone, we're looking to add the use of a outpatient small animal surgical center. With me is Christine White. She is one half of the husband wife team that runs the business. She and her husband have been doing it for decades now on a referral basis where they go to different animal hospitals for their surgeries, strictly on a referral basis, strictly small animals. And they're looking for one place for their business where they can stay. Um, it will be good for Wallingford. It will be good for them as well. It will continue on a referral basis only. I would ask you to consider closely the initial application that came with my letter on June 11th. That 
explains a lot of the detail of their business. And of course, the legal notice was published in the Record Journal. Then finally, my submittal with my letter dated July 30th. Initially, the application was to add se section 13 to 4.9 of the regulation, along with providing for parking in 611. In talking with Kevin, um, he proposed that a definition of outpatient small animal surgical facility would be a good addition, and I agreed. Speaking with both him and Janice Small Corporation Council, both of them concur, confirm that we don't need to re-trigger the, the, the procedure of contacting the regional authority and also re-noticing because adding a definition is just incidental um, to the application. I reviewed the staff comments. I reviewed comments from other departments. I contacted the fire marshal's office. Their concern of having plans isn't at this point. It's more of just notice to the applicant that when the time comes, they're gonna to need to submit floor plans for approval by the fire marshal's office. If you look at my letter from July 30th, I think the most important part is the definition of what an outpatient small animal surgical facility is. It will focus on surgery, a referral basis surgery. Domesticated animals, predominantly dogs and cats, small, you won't see animals or camels or giraffes. All activity will be done indoors at all times, except of course when animals need to do what animals do. There will be a supervised walk um, in a designated area on the outside. Um, and if overnight stays are required, it happens rarely, it would have to be incidental to and necessary as a result of the surgery that occurred. There will be no kennels. There will be no long-term stays. It will just be short term stays necessary as a result of surgery. The parking, just looking at the reg, I got the vibe that this outpatient small animal surgical facility is akin to the medical office, the outpatient medical treatment facility already provided for in the IX zone, and that's where I borrowed, or that's where I took from saying that one space for every 250 square feet would suffice. And if anything, I think there will be less traffic, less parking necessary as a result of this use, as opposed to the human uh, medical treatment facility, because this will just be for surgeries and small animals. The reason why we're looking to go into the IX zone with this use is because we want more of a professional atmosphere as opposed to the commercial atmosphere. The Whites won't run an operation where they do cosmetology. They won't do neutering as a result, unless it's arising out of the surgery. There won't be long-term stays. There won't be animals outside. If anything, going into surgery for your pet is more emotional so we are looking to provide a more professional campus-like setting that's provided for in the IAX zone. We will also be protecting that IAX zone because we're gonna preserve one of the most historic buildings in town, the old Calcaney Real Estate Building. Way north on North Main Street Extension, over Route 68, you see the old Barnes Homestead. That will remain unchanged. All floors will be used for different aspects. There'll be 10 employees, there'll be prep rooms, there'll be surgery rooms, there'll be recovery rooms. The whole building will be used, but it will be kept in its same state right now. And part of the draw for the Whites to do this is they want to protect that building. It's been on the market for a long time. Unfortunately, nothing has, been, um, has gone through, and they're looking to bring their business there for themselves, for the town of Walling, and also protecting that building. In my research into the regulation, um, I went through the regs in various different towns, and I found that this is a growing industry, these boutique surgeries. Uh, for instance, in Wilton, they have ophthalmology for your pets. In Norwalk, they have cardiology for your pets. In Southington, they have dermatology 
for your pets. You know, those blemishes that just won't go away. And in this case, the boutique that we're setting up is for surgery that Christine can tell you more about. Had this industry been around 50 years ago when the zone regulation first came out or 30 years ago when the IX zone was first uh, promulgated, this certainly would have fit into that. We're preserving the building, we're protecting the neighboring residential zones, we're, we're promoting the campus-like setting. It's just now that the industry has changed and commerce has changed, um, we need to add a new label, we need to add a new use inside of the zone. So, we protect the campus-like setting, we're protecting the residential neighbors, we're protecting the building, we're promoting a growing industry in town, and if you have any further questions, I'll do the best that I can, but Christine will certainly be able to do better than that. Thank you, Attorney Lachlan. Questions from the uh, commission for the, uh, for the applicant? Any commission members? Uh, Mr. Bikini, any uh, comments on the application? No, I just wanted to make the point that this is this type of use will be allowed in all uses in the or all areas of the IX and not just in this one location. So that was all I had. Good thing. I guess my only comment would be again I point out uh, is it's included in Mr. Attorney Lachlan's uh, letter where he talks where he shows as far as the uses as he mentioned. You know we do allow outpatient medical treatment facilities uh, in the, in the IX zone. Uh, so, from my perspective, to allow uh, outpatient treatment for, uh, for animals, pets, and again, is what he had indicated, that uh, there would not be any boarding uh, of pets. There may be at a time after a surgery if uh, an animal needed to be uh, kept overnight. You know, that, would be, uh, that would be taken care of, but it wouldn't be an, an ongoing, uh, an ongoing or, or really a highly anticipated uh, event. So with that, again, this is a public hearing. Any members from the public that would like to comment on the application, please come forward, state your name and address. Seeing none, uh, I won't believe there's any other commission, uh, any comments from commission members. Uh, Attorney Lachlan, if you'd like to make any final comments or if your applicant would like to make any comments, you're certainly free to do that. You're not compelled to. We're all set. Thank you. Good, thank you. Uh, at this particular point in time, I'd entertain a motion to, uh, to close the public hearing. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to uh, close the public hearing for application 501-21 zoning text amendment, small animal surgical services of Connecticut. We have a motion to close the public hearing. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Hine, voting beginning with Mr. Cohan. Yes. 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 And yes, at this point in time, I'd entertain a motion on the application. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to approve application 501-21, text amendment, small animal surgical services of Connecticut, LLC, zoning text amendment to section 2.24.9.b.10 and 6.11c of the Wallingford zoning regulations to allow outpatient small animal surgical facilities as an allowed use to the industrial expansion district as proposed in language entitled text amendment small animal surgical facility dated July 30th, 2021 because we currently allow for uh, outpatient treatment facilities in the zone. Uh, this will allow for a uh, professional campus-like atmosphere. It will preserve a historic building and it will also promote a growing industry. We have a motion on the application. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Hine. Voting beginning again with Mr. Cohen. Yes. 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 And yes, the application has been approved. Have a good evening. You too. Thank you. You're welcome. Moves us on to our next item on our agenda, which is a uh, special permit facility housing show at Rosemary Hall, 45 Hill House Avenue. Again, if the applicant would please come forward to begin preparing for uh, the presentation. And Mr. Allenson, if you'd please read the legal notice and note all correspondence for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Legal notice number 407-21.
special permit for Choate Rosemary Hall Foundation for seven detached units of faculty housing at 45 Hill House Avenue, zone R-18. We have a memorandum from Aaron O'Hare, environmental planner, dated July 19th, 2021. We have correspondence from Kevin Pagini, town planner, to uh, Mr. Patrick Durbin, dated July 20th, 2021. We have correspondence from Bay and Lunt, dated January 14th, 1970. Must have been sitting there. <laughs> uh, memorandum from Department of Engineering, dated July 28th, 2021. Correspondence to the Wallingford Planning and Zoning Committee and the Choate Community. Date of receipt, August 3rd, 2021. There appear to be multiple signatures attached and it is a multiple page document. An interdepartmental referral. Date of submission, July 9th, 2021 from our fire marshal. A small site plan, sediment and erosion control plan, I can't even read that small, dated June 1st, 2021, is that correct? That would be it. I think I need glasses. <laughs> um, an inter-office memorandum from Eric Kruger, senior engineer, dated August 4th, 2021. An interdepartmental referral from our environmental planner, date of submission, July 9th, 2021. And a document regarding, well, document entitled, Calculating Rooftop Rainfall from the Rain Catcher Santa Fe, New Mexico, with some photographs and correspondence and notes attached. And I think that's everything, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Allison. At this point in time, if the applicant would please introduce himself and begin his presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For your record, my name is Dennis Sonaviva. I'm an attorney with the Sonaviva Law Firm. I represent the owner and applicant. With us this evening, Mr. Chairman, is Patrick Durbin, who's the Chief Financial Officer of Choate Rosemary Hall. He's He's in the seats behind me. To my left is Darren Overton, who is the project engineer with SLR. And to my right, Sam Sargent, who is with Lazarus and Sargent, the project architect. By way of overview, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the commission, the property is 5.1 acres in size. Uh, there's a board up on the easel. Uh, it is located on the northern side of Hill House Avenue, which is a private road owned by the applicant and verified by a 1970 memo identified by Commissioner Allenson in the record. Uh, the parcel was developed historically with two houses and several garage structures. One house would be retained as part of the project. The applicant proposes to develop the site with a new private cul-de-sac running north, south, about 500 feet in length and 22 feet in width. Uh, the applicant would, with your permission, construct seven new residential single family houses and renovate one existing single family house to be used exclusively as faculty housing. Now Darren's gonna present the engineering aspects of the project, including the road layout, location, and the associated drainage. But I wanted to point out, Mr. Chair, before uh, he gets up to the easel, that um, the applicant has prepared a drainage report that's been reviewed by the town engineer. Uh, we're prepared uh, to address the concerns raised by neighbors in exhibit 407-21E emphasizing um, that the applicant has given a direction to the project team to design this project so as to not only, um, so as not to exacerbate any existing problems of the brook uh, around in the back of some of the North Elm Street properties uh, west of our parcel, but also so as to improve the existing situation within our design. So the design takes into consideration some of the existing uh, concerns of the neighbors, and with that, I'll turn it over to our engineer. Good 
Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. My name is Darren Overton from SLR Consulting. I'm a licensed professional engineer uh, in the state of Connecticut. Um, what I have up here to start with is the, uh, this is the proposed development plan. It's a rendering of the plan which was submitted as part of the application, but I'd like to flip back and just go over the existing conditions. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody is familiar with the area, but this is an existing conditions aerial of the site. As Attorney Senaviva mentioned, the subject parcel here outlined in white is 5.1 acres. There are three existing buildings there, two which are residences, one which is a garage. There's some remnants of some other buildings that have been, been demolished over the years. Um, this property has had development on it going back into the, the 50s uh, as we've looked back through some of the historic aerials. Um, you can see there's development around it to the north. There's existing residential and the cul-de-sac that comes down from the north, which is Dinatali Drive. Um, to the east, I'm sorry, north is to the right on this plan. So to the east at the bottom of the page is other land that's owned by Choate. South is Rosemary Lane, existing residential uh, properties, which other faculty housing properties developed pre previously by Choate. And then over on the west side are existing residential properties uh, that front off of North Elm Street. Uh, and as part of this, the, is the um, highlighted in blue here, there's actually an existing pond that was developed as part of the uh, subdivision to the north. It's a stormwater management basin and there is a water course that's highlighted in blue that comes out of that basin and runs just off of the Choate property through the rear of the uh, abutting properties off of North Elm Street. So the uh, topography of the site is in the, the vegetation. You can see it's mostly wooded, the dark green area. There is developed area around the existing residence and a driveway that comes in to access the residence. There's a ridge line that comes from the north, runs through the center of the site represented by these rounded contours here. And then there's a broad valley that forms on the eastern side of, of the site. This drains in a southerly direction to the existing 12-inch cross culvert that comes across um, Hill House Avenue on the south side of the property. And then the remaining part of the ridge here drains down a slope so you hit a flatter gradient here. Uh, as part of the wetlands application, our soil scientists did identify that there were wetlands that came onto the property associated with the stream corridor and there's some surface runoff that runs down and makes its way towards that stream corridor itself. Uh, there isn't a whole lot of grade change across the site. The high point in the northeast corner is about elevation 218, and as you drop down to the southwest corner of the property, it goes down to about 166. So I'll flip now to the proposed development. Recognizing that we had this ridge through the site, that we do have two separate and distinct watersheds on the site, took that into consideration as part of the stormwater management. So in, in development of this, we have about a 500-foot cul-de-sac that comes in. It's basically a private roadway to serve the new residences. As you can see, the, the garage and one of the buildings is going to be demolished as part of the project to make way for the new development. Um, the existing house here that's going to remain is going to be renovated and also will have uh, a garage addition on the back of it. And then you'll see the seven new re residences that wrap around the cul-de-sac with individual driveways coming off uh, of the cul-de-sac. We also have a stormwater management basin. As I mentioned before, there's this broad valley that comes down. In, in replacement of that valley, essentially these houses are going to be developed and the surface runoff is going to go onto the roadway. We do have a stormwater collection system in the roadway that comes down and ties into that stormwater basin. The stormwater basin considers not only uh, management of peak flow attenuation, but also water quality. The catch basins themselves have sumps in them, which will collect the coarse sediments. We do have a sediment four bay recommended by DEP as part of, in their stormwater manual, as part of the standard design of stormwater basins. So that will filter out other sediments that come into the basin. And then we've designed an overflow structure and storage within the basin there's storage in the bottom of the basin for the water quality volume, and then above that, there's peak flow attenuation volume. We've designed an overflow structure, and then as part of this, we have an upgrade of the culvert. The 12-inch culvert gets upgraded to two 15-inch pipes. Um, in doing this design, we do an analysis for the two-year storm up to the 100-year storm. We believe the existing cross culvert that was put in wasn't necessarily designed to handle the 100-year storm flow. So even though we, hit, we have the stormwater basin, <coughs> that has the peak flow attenuation, so we have no increase in peak runoff. 
we do have an upgrade associated with that. The discharge is in the same location as the existing 12-inch pipe, which runs over other land of uh, Choate and then into the watercourse as it did previously. So as part of the design, we are cognizant that there is a stream channel over here. We do have runoff on to adjacent uh, properties. And as part of development with the roadway going up the ridge line and creating the cul-de-sac and, and the grading for the homes which sit above the roadway, there's a portion of the existing watershed that gets diverted into the stormwater basin and away from the actual overland flow into the stream channel. So I have a, a graphic here which in our stormwater management report that we prepared and submitted as part of the application, there's existing and proposed watersheds. This is the existing map. Watershed 10 represents that flow, stormwater flow, surface flow that comes into that broad channel under existing conditions and makes its way to the 12 inch cross culvert. Then watershed 20 here, which goes to analysis point B, is the, the hillside runoff that goes directly into the stream channel. So the difference under proposed conditions is represented by the red line. So the red line here represents the existing watershed. The black line represents the proposed. And you can see the areas here where the watershed is actually being diverted away from the western runoff and comes into the stormwater basin. So simply by taking that runoff associated with the roadway, which we want to treat in the basin and provide the water quality volume, we reduce the amount of runoff to the west by the reduction in watershed. And then we handle that here in the stormwater basin and again discharge it in the same manner as it does under existing conditions. So we've sought to maintain the existing watersheds to the extent practical and also manage the stormwater on our site in an appropriate way. So we do have another small discharge point for the under drain which comes over to this location. Um, there's the corner lot here uh, off of Elm Street and Hill House Avenue is another property that's owned by Choate. So all of our controlled discharges uh, will remain on the Choate property. We don't discharge towards any private properties uh, off of that owned by Choate. So as part of this, we also did prepare a sediment and erosion control plan. Um, we only have about 3.1 acres of development associated with this 5.1 acre parcel. With the ridge and the divide in here, the watersheds are further broken up. On the west side, the uh, erosion controls are basically handled by perimeter controls with silt fence and hay bales, uh, which can handle up to a one acre watershed of disturbance. And then on this side, we're using the permanent stormwater basin as a sediment trap during construction. And we have diversion berms and swales that are proposed on the plan uh, to meet the DEP uh, erosion control guidelines as well as the town's regulations for erosion controls. So that's about it as far as the presentation. Now one thing I do want to note is that um, this stream itself is a very low gradient stream um, just off of the site. Um, typically we look at higher gradient streams and low gradient streams, a threshold about 2% uh, slope. This one has less than a 10%, uh, I'm sorry, less than a 1% slope. So it is, is a very low gradient stream through here and it does have a wetland corridor that's associated with it. We've identified that on uh, our side of the property and then published mapping shows that it does extend uh, on the other side of the stream as well onto the uh, neighboring properties. So with that, I can either turn it back to Attorney Seneviva or uh, Sam Sargent for a presentation on the architecture or... If I might, Mr. Chair, I, I just wanted to have Darren uh, just um, review one more time um, perhaps some more lay language for someone like me, the, the difference in the watershed, that by reducing the watershed area 20, that that would minimize the flows going to that existing stream, which is on the backyards of no, a number of the North Elm Street properties. I just wanted to emphasize that, Darren, so that, as I understand it, you've shown the red line, which is the new uh, area of watershed 20. It's a, it's a larger area uh, for um, east and, and a smaller area heading west. Yes, so based on this, we have analysis point B, which goes to the stream to the west. We have analysis point A, which is our discharge from the basin. And essentially we show in our computations that there's about a 5% reduction in runoff in either watershed. We achieve it at analysis point B by diverting some of the, the watershed, not necessarily intentionally, but it's a, by part of the development in developing the road along the ridge and expanding the cul-de-sac that goes down a portion of the western ridge by development and the grading, we do divert a little bit of the watershed away from the west. In 
doing so, we reduce the runoff to the west. In, in moving that watershed and developing the area, changing the land cover in watershed 10, that requires stormwater management for us to collect and store that water and meter it back to um, meet the peak flow attenuation so that we have that small 5% decrease in peak flows for the development. So again, just so I'm clear, when you were talking about the flow west of the stream, you're indicating from what the current uh, flow down to that area is now, it's being reduced by your, what you're proposing is going to be reduced by 5%, is that correct, or approximately 5%? Yes. Is that's that what you're, that's what you've indicated? Yes. Okay. And it, eventually all of the stormwater that goes into the stream, whether it's watershed 20 or watershed 10, uh, makes its way into the stream in, in some manner further south uh, of the site. So it either runs off directly into the stream and goes through the cross culvert that's here under Hillhouse Avenue, or it makes its way through the stormwater system and gets into that stream further south. So it's still all in the same watershed. It's just looking at the site itself specifically, there's two separate watersheds of how water runs off from this property. Okay, thank you. I just want to make that clear, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, I know that there probably are people from the neighborhood, I wanted to make certain, because you know, the normal reaction is that when you take now pervious area and you make it impervious with a cul-de-sac with the buildings, that somehow that would exacerbate the existing problem that um, I understand has existed for years over in that stream location with, um, wet backyards, the plan is to um, certainly not exacerbate, but even more so, even at a 5% mitigation of the existing watershed area uh, to that stream. Uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I'm going to ask uh, our architect, Sam Sargent, to just explain a little bit about the uh, buildings being proposed. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, My name is Samuel Sargent. Uh, Principal in the firm of Lazarus and Sargent Architects at 50 North Main Street. And uh, I'd like to just use the engineering drawing for a second. Uh, what, of course, we're proposing here is seven new buildings and one existing building. The seven new buildings are almost identical to the buildings that have been built across Hill, uh, a hillside. And uh, I believe they were built in 19, uh, sorry, 2014, 2015. The only existing building is, of course, the one on the corner. Um, what we're proposing is uh, a series of, and let me just put my architectural drawing up here. That's it. Is six center hall colonials uh, and one expanded cape. The eighth house is, of course, the craftsman style vintage. Uh, cottage on the corner of Hill House and the New Street. The uh, colonials will range from uh, three bedrooms with a bonus room at about uh, 2,700 square feet, uh, sorry, 2,400 square feet, to four bedrooms with a uh, bonus room at 2,700 square feet. The Cape will be about 1,800 square feet. And uh, uh, the last one, the three bedroom Central Hall Colonial with no uh, bonus room be about 2,000 square feet. The exterior finishes will be uh, clad, uh, clabbered in keeping with uh, the style of these houses with uh, um, a synthetic trim. And um, the architectural detailing will be as per uh, Choate's normal high level, high standard for uh, creating these houses as seen across the road on Rosemary uh, uh, Drive there. The uh, last house, the eighth house, we're treating as a uh, semi-historical piece by trying to maintain the existing trim and siding. What we will be doing is the existing siding is vinyl siding on top of deteriorated uh, original siding, and we'll re be replacing that with uh, a composite shingle siding and composite trim. And uh, we'll be maintain maintaining the architectural details wherever possible. The uh, finished materials will extend onto the addition and the garage that we're proposing to be added to, uh, to that building. The last thing I'd like to bring up is uh, throughout this uh, design uh, uh, process, Chote has um, emphasized their idea that what uh, this development should be is 
a showcase of passive house design, which is low uh, environmental in, uh, impact. And to do that, what we've done is we've provided a high level of envelope insulation uh, in the roof where code requires 49, R49, we're providing R68. The walls uh, under code require R20, we're providing R38. The floor assemblies over unconditioned spaces where the code requires R30, we'll be pro providing R38. We've worked hard uh, to eliminate all thermal bridging and air infiltration points in the exterior uh, building envelope, and we've provided a high efficiency heating cooling system incorporating an air-to-air -air energy recovery uh, fresh air exchange unit. Uh, we are providing uh, triple glazed windows and high efficiency doors, and in addition, the base bid calls for the possibility of Tesla photovoltaic roof shingles, and uh, that would certainly uh, reduce the impact, the electrical load of these new buildings on the site. In summary, uh, Choate intends these new houses in this development to showcase their commitment to the uh, environmental impact of passive house design, low environmental impact of passive house design. And gentlemen, that's all I have today. Thank you, sir. That's our presentation, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Commission members with uh, questions for the applicant. Any commission members? Mr. Uh, Pagini, uh, comments on the, uh, on the application? Uh, no, I'll just note the public correspondence regarding the stream. I've received several uh, comments regarding that. Okay. Good. Thank you. Again, this is a public hearing. Are there any members of the public that would like to uh, comment on the application? If uh, you would, please come forward with uh, your name and address and your comments. Michael Mancino. 14 Sunset Drive, Wallingford, but basically I'm speaking for my... Sir, chair. if you could please just come a little bit closer to the microphone sure. so they can pick Michael you up. Michael Mancino, you. 14 Sunset Drive. I'm basically speaking for my grandchildren at 367 North Elm Street, which is across from their property. A um, couple of things. I gave you a packet, basically some pictures and some information. Uh, the first page being that the amount of water that a 2,000 square foot uh, building would basically accumulate. Uh, and basically it comes down to uh, a 2,000 square foot house doesn't allow for 61,000 gallons of water per year uh, based on a 49 uh, inch rainfall that we have in Wallingford per year. So if you look at the overall project, you're basically looking at half a million gallons of water. Now, they did a nice job, don't get me wrong. They've pushed a lot of the water to the, I guess you would call that, east and into their retention pond. So they're trying to do what they can. But you're still going to have a significant amount of water going into the existing waterway. Having said that, um, my concern is the existing waterway doesn't move. And and part of the reason why it doesn't move, if you look at the two pictures, the first two pictures showing you the water there, that's not moving at all. And if you follow back to the fourth picture, it shows you 311 North Elm Street. I have it indicated on there as 311 North Elm. That property is the one that these gentlemen are talking about that belongs to Cho. And if you follow the pictures further back, the last one, or the next to last one, excuse me, this is the actual back of the property at 3 and 11, 3 and 11, excuse me, North Elm Street. That is the brook. That is the property that they own, and the brook is actually blocked at their property, and that's supposed to be where it drains out through a pipe underneath Hill House, Hill House Avenue, which it's not doing. So apparently, they're not really assisting with the water condition that we have up there. And putting this project through as little as it's going to come down from the existing project, I believe there will be significant amount of water added to it. 
as much as they're trying to not have it there. Their problem is at, they're building at 311 North Elm Street. It's blocking the water coming downhill. If you notice that, that is the backyard. So we've had West Nile virus in Wallingford and that area is wet. It's a, they didn't create the problem there, it's there, but they're adding to it and they could certainly do better. And I would appreciate any help that they could provide. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, would the applicant like to address those? Uh, I, I assume you folks are, if have seen this. If not, you're welcome to. You can take just a few moments, if you would, to look at it. And then if you'd please comment on the gentleman's comments. Again, for the record, Darren Overton from SLR Consulting. Um, I have been on the site and have witnessed the stream from looking at it from the, uh, the Cho property uh, along the uh, western property line and then also uh, at Hill House Avenue. Um, I did notice that there are areas, and again, as I mentioned, it's a low gradient stream, so there are some areas where there is standing <coughs> water. Um, one thing in a most recent site visit, um, I was out there last week uh, with the facilities director and we did look at the cross culverts under Hill House Avenue and we did notice that there was a, uh, looked look like a piece of firewood um, that was stuck in the main cross culvert. Um, so as part of this project, we will go in there and clean out the firewood or any debris that's in there that could be blocking flow. But I also looked downstream of the culvert and there's standing water at the downstream end as this stream extends into what is a very densely wooded wetland. Um, so I believe there's some debris that's further south of the site on private properties that could be holding up some of the flow as well. Um, but there isn't much that can be done as far as these pockets of standing water because it's such a low gradient stream. We can't increase the slope of the, st of the stream. It, it is what it is by nature. Um, but the, as part of the project, we are willing to look at those cross culverts, clean out any sediment. Clearly there's some debris that's been collected in there. Um, and the, the rest of it is really, there's part of it that's a natural stream corridor that extends from Hill House Avenue where it's just kind of, as you can see in the photographs, the longer grass and the channel runs through there. Part of it is wooded and then part of it is actually, some of the backyards are actually mowed areas where the mowed lawn comes right up to the channel. So. The, the conditions vary where it's in a more natural situation. Some of the flow can be slowed down by the vegetation while it's growing. Um, so I think inevitably there's going to be some pockets of standard water. It's just a natural um, occurrence in a low gradient stream. But we will, um, as part of the project, clean out any of the culverts um, that are associated with it to make sure there's no restrictions in flow there. But also, again, the gentleman showed on his I think it was the next to last, unfortunately I don't have it right in front of me right now, but I think you mentioned the next to last picture on there where at least looking at it, it appeared to be in the stream somewhat, may I have that please, somewhat, uh, you know, somewhat overgrown. And again, just by, by looking at it, I'm not quite, not quite sure with this, you know, what, what it depicts and where the stream is versus what's being, you know, what's being depicted on the, on this picture. So that's a natural wet meadow area that comes in that's associated with the wetlands on either side of the stream corridor. And this time of year when the vegetation is tall and lush, um, you can see in this picture, you actually can't see the channel unless you're looking right up it. Um, I suppose there is a possibility that working with the wetlands commission that could be mowed and maintained as well on the property that that show downs. You 
can see in the first picture, when you're looking right up the channel, you can see that the channel. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, I, I see that there. So, okay, good. Thank you. Other uh, other members of the uh, public that would like to comment. Uh, sure. There's no. Well, let me ask you if there are any other members of the public that would like to comment, and then we'll go back to you, sir. Again, Mike Mancino. Um, the picture that we were referring to was right behind 311 North Elm Street. That is their property, and that is choked off. And I can remember the prior owner. I've been there long enough, and that was always kept clean and water flowed. And as he just pointed out, the tube or whatever it is on the Hill House that's supposed to be allowing that water to drain is blocked by firewood. So apparently it's not being maintained as it should be. So I'm not sure if this project is going to exacerbate the situation, which we all don't want. And it is a downhill flow, so water should be flowing. And as my next person will tell you, that we've had this place dry, okay? It's, we don't want to have more water added to it especially if it's not going to be allowed to flow because of irresponsibility, basically. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Other members of the uh, public would like to uh, comment on the application? Good evening, Mike Votto, 377 North Elm Street. Um, forgive my ignorance, but some of the things, uh, sir, that you, I forgot what his name was, um, the architect, or I mean, you're the architect. Uh, came up with the drawings. There were a couple of things that I, I didn't get, and I was wondering if you could explain um, in layman terms. Uh, you mentioned that there, there will be erosion controls. Can you explain that again? If you just first just address your comments to the commission, then, oh, we'll, I'm go, sorry. then we'll ask. Then All right. I need an explanation it's just on erosion I'm control on. then. Sure, absolutely. Again, if the uh, applicant would uh, speak on the uh, erosion controls. Sure, so during construction, there are erosion control standards that need to be met um, while it is under construction and we have exposed soils on site. So those um, requirements are typically written into zoning regulations like you have here in Wallingford and also DEP provides a uh, guidance document for design of erosion controls. So we've included, as I mentioned, perimeter controls of silt fence um, along the, the lower sides of the disturbance as part of the construction and, and earth moving for the project. Um, when the catch basins go in, and those will have uh, inlet protection that will trap sediment uh, so that it doesn't get into the drainage system. It'll trap the coarse sediments during construction. There's temporary berms and swales that are proposed that'll direct the surface runoff uh, under exposed soil conditions towards the stormwater basin that will be used to trap sediment. Um, and then when slopes are established, we have proposed erosion co control blankets on those slopes in order to establish those slopes quickly. And then as the grading gets finished up and topsoil, there's permanent seeding that's proposed. And once the permanent vegetation is established, the erosion controls are then removed. So the erosion controls really serve as a temporary uh, method for controlling water quality and preventing sediment runoff while the project is under construction and while there's earth moving and the soils are disturbed. So you're saying, uh, so is he saying basically it's during construction that this, that what you're referring to when you say er erosion controls? Uh, yeah, I believe, I believe that's, okay. that, that's the question, or no. that's the answer, sir. Okay, thank you. Now, the houses will still be on a hill in comparison to the homes on North Elm Street, and there will be water still coming down, um, I would imagine. I mean, you can't control all the water going into the sewer system, the storm sewers and whatnot. Um, and my next question is, are trees going to be removed between the Cho property and the homes on North Elm Street? There are, it's, it's pretty densely uh, filled with trees. I'm just wondering if, that, if most of them are going to be taken down to accommodate the houses. And again, if the gentleman would respond. Yes, again, Darren Overton for the record. There, there will be trees removed within the area disturbance within the development area for the project. Um, the change in land cover has been taken into consideration as part of our stormwater management computations. Um, one thing I didn't mention as far as the stormwater management for the houses, 
uh, on the west side of the proposed access drive, we did include um, dry wells uh, to collect the roof runoff. Those are sized to collect the first inch of runoff from uh, the, the roofs of the houses and allow for that to infiltrate into the ground. So that is also part of what we've considered as, as part of the um, stormwater management design. The Wellens Commission likes to see that because it, it promotes groundwater recharge you know, into the ground to match um, similar to existing conditions, recognizing that there's change in land cover and there is some pervious surface that's going to be proposed as part of this. So that restores some of the uh, groundwater recharge. On your plans, would, would you be able to show the where the trees are that are going to be removed in the extent of that, if you would, please. This plan may represent it the best. Um, this, uh, let me just flip over to existing to start. So we have an existing condition. Uh, Mr. Votto is correct. This dark green area is an area of that's wooded right now. Um, when you flip over to this page, you can see that along the perimeter of the disturbance, we show that in the dark green is the wooded vegetation that's going to remain. And then the lighter green is what we anticipate is going to be lawn areas. So along here, there is going to be an area of tree loss that's associated with development of the property. Thank you. When you say vegetation, is that trees? Yes. Um, and you did just mentioned something about uh, dry wells? Yes. It, it, I'm it, sorry, it just, I keep doing the wrong oh, thing. That's, a, that's quite all right. I get confused sometimes, um, too. Dry wells to do that are going to be put behind the houses? I, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not an engineer at all, as you can imagine. So if you can explain that again. If you would, sir, please. Sure. So a, a dry well is basically a concrete structure that is excavated and placed in the ground. It is designed with a storage volume. As I mentioned, it's the first inch of runoff from the roof area. It, it will be able to hold that volume and allow it to infiltrate in, into the ground. To the extent that that storage is exceeded, the roof leaders would then spill over onto the, onto the ground surface and again have an opportunity to naturally infiltrate through the lawn area before it runs off into the stream. See, my, my concerns, it's sort of in conjunction with another problem, an, exist, an existing problem that we, who are, uh, who abut that brook or had that brook in their backyard with the retention basin on Farm Hill, at the bottom of Farm Hill. Uh, we are presently still fighting, or not fighting, but trying to get that problem solved for about 40 years now. Um, and that has increased the water flow and standing water in that brook. And now what I'm concerned about is any kind of development beyond those trees or where those trees are, it, you have to expect more water is gonna come into that brook. I don't care how many things you do. And when you take trees down, the roots hold the, 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 uh, hold the soil, and now those, those trees will be down. I'm thinking more erosion is gonna take place. You know, my concern is not so much the water, I mean, I am concerned about water staying still, but the issue is there's too much water. That water is in that brook high all the time. When I first moved to North Elm Street in 1973, that brook was bone dry all summer. As soon as Farm Hill went up, there's water in it all the time. And what bothers me in, at the Inland Wetlands uh, Commission meeting uh, some person that showed hired uh, mentioned a science, she's some kind of a scientist, that she looked at the land and there was intermittent times when the, when the pond was dry. Not true. And you could ask any of the neighbors on that list of names that you have. Never is, it's never dry. So, you know, right away you start thinking to yourself, we're, given to, we're being told there's all these precautions that are going to take place. I've been burnt in the past. And I'm afraid uh, what's said is not going to really happen. So what recourse do we have if that brook continues to be filled with water? I mean, beyond the brook, most of my neighbors can't even walk back there anymore. It's so saturated. 
And I'm just concerned that a little bit, I don't care how much more, any amount more of water is going to make it even, even worse. Um, and the other thing that I'm concerned about is, um, I did have a question, if you could ask them what a low graded stream means. Sure. Gentlemen, definition of a low, uh, low grade stream, please. Low gradient stream is a stream that has less than 2% slope. Um, based on the GIS contours that we looked at along the stream channel, there's that the existing stream channel is about 0.8% slope, so it's just slightly below 1%, so well within the range of a low gradient stream. Okay. Um, if you were to, ex to, to okay this or and vote in favor of this, is there anything that could be put in the motion that would you know, have some recourse for us if this did, if their plans did not work, you know, uh, you know, something has to be done every five years to make sure whatever they had in place is working correctly. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of using that other retention basin as a, a basis here because I've seen what happens that the town did not maintain it and now it's privately owned and it's even worse the problem, which is why I think most of us have the excess water because it should be a retention pond and it is not, it's a pond. So there's no water, it's not empty so that water can fill up when, when it rains. Um, if we, I have pictures of that last rainstorm we had a couple weeks ago. Um, my whole backyard up to Choke property and De Natale's property or Farm Hill, all the way over maybe three houses, it was like a lake. Now everybody in the past has told me, well that's a hundred year storm, it doesn't happen very often. Well folks, I'm here to tell you that hundred year storms happen every couple of years in our backyards. So I, again, I'm, I am concerned, yes, the water is stagnant, but folks, believe me, that pond, that brook rather, is filled to the top all the time. And there has to be some more water coming in, and I'm not convinced at this point that putting up those, that cul-de-sac is not going to make it worse. That's it. Thank you, sir. Any other members of the public who would like to speak on the application? No, sir. We're young lady would like to speak. Thank you. My name's Laura Spateri and I live at 325 North Elm Street, a few doors down from 311. Been there 31 and a half years. My question for the commission, if they could please ask the applicant, when they are removing those current structures in the back, would they be, or will they be considering taking out the dead trees? And I noticed with the diagram, those aren't part of any removal currently, or they didn't mention it. But those dead trees, they're coming down the hill. Those block the stream. I don't know about firewood. I don't walk back there. But things like that. When they took two cabins down, though, ooh, five, six years ago, really? five or six years ago that we had asked them about because they were dilapidated, falling down the hill, they removed the structures. And there is runoff in the winter that comes through from snowstorms because it sort of eroded away. So I'd like to just ask if we can make sure that that didn't happen again. Thank you. Thank you. Again, if the applicant would like to address those concerns. So certainly with the development of the new homes, um, if you look to remove any dead trees that may be any sort of a threat to those new homes or um, any issue relative to the stream channel itself. And as I mentioned previously, we do have erosion controls in place during construction that are, are going to be implemented in order to prevent significant erosion from the property. If you could just pull the microphone a little bit closer to you. I see our red light is flashing a bit. <laughs> the erosion controls are in place uh, such that to, to prevent significant erosion from the property during construction. Um, recognizing that there's exposed soils, there is going to be some soil that um, does get into suspension during rainfalls, but we have perimeter controls and the controls are designed to meet the town and DEP standards um, for erosion controls during construction. So it should prevent any significant erosion, but certainly there, it, it, during rain events, there's going to be some suspension of sediments, but there's significant traps in place to collect and trap those on site and manage them as part of the construction. Thank you. Any members of the public like to make any final comments? Uh, yes, sir, there's a young lady that's behind you. You're going to have to be patient. Thank you. Good evening, Sarah Mancino, 
367 North Elm Street. Um, I've worked on the letter that you have in front of you that um, has signatures from uh, all of the abutting properties that are along North Elm Street. Uh, spoke with all of the residents um, and even walked into their backyards that I hadn't been in before. And it's amazing the difference that you will see from one backyard starting at the Vados, going over to ours, and moving downstream towards 311, which is the, the property that Choate owns. The, it's a vast difference from property to property. Uh, again, you've heard that many of us have standing water in our backyard um, on the other side of the stream, which abuts the Choate property, where it's soggy, you will sink in. Um, there are other properties that have major blockages where you can hardly see the the path of the stream um, because of some of the growth that's there. And you'll also notice, note in uh, the document that we presented um, some information on fragmites because there are some properties that have extensive fragmite growth and that's in a very invasive, non-native plant species, which if you look at the document um, with the attached photos that you were given earlier, um, behind 311, um, they, they mentioned that it was you know, lush growth this time of year, that's not just grass. Uh, a significant portion of that is fragmite growth, um, and it's starting to permeate up the stream. It's not taken care of right there in the back of 311. It's covered over that whole area where it would go into whatever they have, what culverts or the channel that goes underneath 311. Um, and it's, th those, the growth is starting to move upstream as well. The problem with that is that the more water that ends up coming down the stream, and you, you can't prevent, <laughs> water goes downhill. It's, it's, it's gonna happen. I get that they have measures in place and that's fantastic. Um, but as the homeowners that are gonna be b directly below this development, we have that concern because we already have all of this water in our backyards. This fragmite growth is going to continue if nothing's done. Um, and it po does pose a significant threat to native wildlife and it's a great harboring ground for, um, for, for mosquitoes as well because of the way it just keeps the ground saturated in that way. Um, our concern is what, what are our yards going to look like? These are the, the spaces that just like anybody else that we enjoy with our children, with our family, where, where we entertain, where we find you know relaxation. And if this development adds to the issues that we're already experiencing, then where are we going in terms of <laughs> the, the space that we have to enjoy in, in our land? Um, the, they mentioned something about the, the low gradient stream. I get it, it does not slope a lot. However, again, in the backyards, you'll see that some of the channels, the banks of the stream are very well defined. It's not like it's, you know, totally flat. So there's, Again, I, I understand it's, it's nature, it can't affect the slope, but at the same time, uh, uh, amazing tasks are done to work with nature and how it's planned. And if something could be done coming in to make that channel uh, drain better, flow properly, present, pre prevent uh, continued blockages or anything like that, that would have a huge impact on the homeowners in the area, um, our backyards, the way that we're able to enjoy the space and make sure that it's a healthy uh, environment for our families. Thank you. Uh, I guess just looking at, uh, listening to her comments, it, it, certainly the stream that being talked about goes across several properties, but as far as what's on Choate property, what can be done from Choate's standpoint to perhaps increase or help well, increase the flow of that, of that stream. You mentioned that there was in the channel, there's some wood, there's some blockage. Certainly you're, you're talking about uh, uh, or planning to, to remove that. Uh, but as far as what other types of uh, maintenance issues, ongoing maintenance issues, could you folks uh, propose in order to uh, perhaps alleviate this, this issue as best you can you know, on the uh, on the Choate property. So I, I, I agree um, that the channel is fairly well defined. Um, it's about, and it varies somewhat, it's about a three foot wide channel, it's about a foot deep. Um, 
the, there are Phragmites out there. You can actually see it in the background of this first picture that was, uh, was submitted. Um, in, in my estimation, in being out there looking at it in the field, that this is all native grass here that's on the actual 311 Cho property and that the Phragmites are likely further north of that. Um, I believe, um, you know, again, based on looking at it in the field, and it's not, you know, you don't, you don't see the lines that you see on paper when you're out in the field, but that stand of Phragmites probably is on multiple properties, but I don't think it comes as far south as 311. Um, but certainly, um, periodic mowing of this vegetation, particularly along the channel, because the vegetation during higher flows will slow down the flows, so that could help move the water along. And particularly doing that on the 311 property, the lower part of the watershed, making sure that doesn't restrict and hold the water up um, would be a benefit. And I would think that Choate would be willing to consider that and, and will be willing to consider a conversation with vegetation management um, with the neighbors. So the mowing right now is not being done right now or periodic mowing to the best, I guess, to the best of your, your knowledge, that's not being done right now. Is that perhaps fair to say? Based on what I see out here is a, a pretty natural um, uh, wetland that's out there as far as a um, meadow type wetland. It's not wooded. There isn't really any woody vegetation in there at all. It's all grasses and other plants. The types of vegetation does vary. You could see further in the background of the, of the, of the photo. Part of the stream is wooded as you go through um, the various backyards. Um, going further, some of, as I mentioned, some of the backyards are, both sides are mowed right down to the stream channel and maintained on a regular basis, um, almost you know close to a, a maintained lawn situation. So it, it varies as you move along that stream channel within the area. Okay. Thank you, sir. Other members of the public like to speak? And could I just get a show of hands of who else uh, would like to speak on the application? If you would, please. Uh, good evening. My name is Lois Schock, and I reside at 319 North Elm. I've been there for 20 years. When I moved in, my backyard was mowable. It is impossible. I've lost a third of my backyard these phragmites. You can't walk in my backyard without hiking boots on up to here or you'll sink. They came from the Choate property and I brought pictures. I'm sorry I didn't make copies, but I'd be more than happy to share them with... Uh, if you just please submit them. Uh to me, if you would, please, and I'll pass them on to the commission, and we'll keep them for the record. Bless you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Go that way first. Now, to remove these invasive Phragmites is quite a deal. I've been chopping them down for 20 years. And actually, last April 27th, I actually had a stroke in my backyard, chopping down Phragmites and burning them. They have to be treated with two separate chemicals. They have to be sprayed in late August after the plumes grow. I can't even walk through that area. First of all, I'm done chopping. Phragmites after the stroke. That's not going to happen. This past week, I had a member from uh, the planning and zoning to come to lower my taxes because I've lost so much of my property. But the main thing is that stream. Nothing moves. My backyard is probably the worst of all of them. I mean, it's, it's just a a mosquito nightmare. It would be wonderful if our good neighbors could help us maintain this stream, clean it up. I've enjoyed being a neighbor of Choate, very much so. And I'm sure that these new houses are going to be beautiful, like the other houses across the way. So we're really here asking for their help with this. And I, I hope somebody will listen. Thanks. 
Thank you very much. And I think at this point in time, I don't see any other members that would like to speak other than this gentleman. Okay, I'm sorry, sir. Good evening. Uh, Phil Euchre, 29 Curtis Avenue. Um, I just hear lots of concerns from some of my neighbors in town, and I was struck by the changes in the uh, tree cover from the two images I just saw. Um, Choke owns a lot of property. Uh, several years ago, there was a planned development for an auditorium on Beaumont Avenue, which they, um, I'm very glad to see that they were able to move over to a current location on Christian Street. Uh, I guess my question is, if there were any other alternative locations on their campus, for example, about 300 yards to the east of this, which would not be a budding town property and which would not require the removal of so much trees. Thank you. Would the applicant like to uh, address that uh, comment? Uh, Mr. Chairman, perhaps someone from the Choate uh, family. I'm not familiar with the property that the gentleman was talking about. Is there anyone from the uh, Choate family that would like to make any comments on that? And again, sir, your, your name and address, please. Sure. Uh, Patrick Durbin. Um, I'm the CFO of Joe Rosemary Hall, um, 333 Christian Street. So we did consider other um, kind of existing land that we own, but for the um, proximity to the other faculty housing up on Rosemary Lane, um, and this site just makes the most sense and fits the house is properly for the current needs that we have at this moment. Good enough. Thank you, sir. And again, I think this gentleman will be our, uh, be our last. Um, okay, we're not going to keep coming back to everyone here. I'd ask people, if you, uh, members of the public rather, if you have questions, please state your questions. We'll get you answers because we're not going to go through rounds two, three, and four. So again, uh, Sir, if you'd like to make some final, if you have some final comments or questions. The only reason why is because... Answer Again, just name and address, sir, please. Michael Mancino, 14 Sunset Drive, Wallingford. The only reason why I come up is because there are answers that are given that are not actually fully truthful, let's put it that way. The, the growth behind 311 is not a natural growth. Yeah, if you let things go, of course it's going to overgrow, and that's what's happened. I can remember when uh, a person named Duke Del Greco owned the house prior to Choate, and that waterway would always be flowing and clear and dry up. Now it's just allowed to be overgrown, and that's part of the big problem, where it's blocking what's coming downstream. So a little help as young lady just said would be a great help. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And again, at this point in time, I don't see anyone else that would like to comment on the application. I guess I would uh, go to our, our, our town planner. Uh, Mr. Pagini, you've heard some of the comments mm -hmm. certainly made by the, uh, the public uh, concerning uh, the, the stream and uh, apparent some blockages in the stream. Uh, is there something, if this commission were inclined to approve this application, is there something uh, that you would recommend uh, to address some of those issues as far as, you know, maintenance? And I'm not sure if that was discussed with the Inland Wetlands Commission as far as, you know, maintenance plan uh, for the stream. I don't. Some, <clears throat> some you know, mowing, something, uh, something in that, that nature. I don't believe it was. I don't see anything in her memo that uh, references it. Um, but as far as regulatory uh, language would go, there's nothing in our current regulations that would, you know, possibly allow for a maintenance plan or for inspection by water and sewer or anything at this point. But I think you could probably do some kind of uh, uh, language that would, you know, uh, have the applicant maybe inspect the stormwater system routinely, um, do 
some kind of cleanups to ensure that the, that the stream is flowing correctly. Um, but as far as regulatory language is concerned, uh, being as, you know, as a, it's, it's, it's a kind of tough to, as far as the, the adjacent property, it would be hard to put something in there that would require them to do cleanup. Well, I would look, I, I, again, I, I'm not, not thinking of something for a, a mm -hmm. adjacent properties. I'm, I'm talking more specifically about their property as far as having any requirement that there's a, you know, a periodic clean out of, of, of the stream that's on, you know, that, that's simply on, on, on their property. Again, it was mentioned there was some, right. uh, you know, some trees or logs, lumber in there. I know it was mentioned that farther down, uh, there appears to be some trees that may be dead trees, what have you, that are on other people's property, not Cho's property, which is, would not be then their responsibility. I'm speaking more just specifically mm -hmm. on Chode's property and as far as maintenance of, of the stream, which is on, on their property, as far as clean out, something in that, right. that nature, that's, that's really what I'm referring to. Yeah, I think you could write language that would address uh, all of the issues um, in a way that uh, the applicant would be um, you know, able to perform some kind of clean house, some kind of routine inspection of the stormwater system to make sure that it's uh, performing to the way it was designed on the plans. Um, but as far as, yeah, like I said, there's nothing in our regulations that would require no, I, that. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I understand that. Okay, thank you. Again, I'll bring it back to the commission for comments from commission members. Mr. Uh, Mr. Cohan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, to, to your point, I, I do have a number of conditions of approval that I've jotted down, um, you know, pertaining to, you know, maintenance of the, you know, the culvert and, and the, you know, looking at the overall, you know, stream bed and around the property. Um, so, you know, I can read these off to the, yeah, I think maybe perhaps it would be beneficial to uh, just send, uh, give what your, uh, so what, what your issue, not issues, but what some of your ideas for addressing it and discuss that with the applicant. So, okay, thank you. Um, so the, these were, you know, based on the discussion from the residents, these are the uh, conditions of approval that, you know, I have in mind. And, you know, I just want to run them by you, see if you're okay with this. And the first one was, you know, clean out that culvert. Um, but then, you know, maintain some type of regular maintenance routine to, to ensure that the culvert, you know, is, is free flowing. Um, you know, the engineer mentioned um, working with inland wetlands to get approval to, to mow some of that area to free up the flow. Um, you know, I, you, you do have to get permission to, to do that. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm sure they would be willing to do that, um, grant that, that permission. So that, that was another condition I had. Um, the engineer also mentioned he would look for any other uh, impediments to the stream, you know, on your property and you know if you could um, you know do that do do a pretty good inspection you know somebody mentioned the uh, dead trees and you know things like that which may be you know blocking things as well um, so those those were the the three or four things I that you know, I thought could help with this. Thank you, Mr. Cohan. Other, uh, I don't know if the applicant would like to make any comments on that. Certainly what's been stated seems, seems to be very reasonable. Mr. Chairman, yes, I've had an opportunity to discuss this with my client. Uh, I think they are reasonable suggestions. I can tell you that um, the Wetlands Commission did have as a condition, uh, not specifically to uh, maintenance of the stream or brook area, but what they did say was that during the course of construction, it was one of the conditions of approval number five, that there's the possibility of the discharge of some sediment flows to this location during that 
especially uh, significant storm events. And so they, they directed that the, um, the air, this particular area be monitored closely before and after storm events for adequacy of protections, any deficiencies to be rectified as soon as possible. So there is an acknowledgement in our obligation in that permit. This would be, I think, uh, another uh, prudent uh, condition of, of uh, any approval and, and Chote is uh, certainly in favor of that. Sure. And again, just for clarification, the inland wetlands, that is just during construction, correct? Correct. So, that is correct. So it, again, what Mr. Uh, Cohan would be proposing, uh, perhaps in a, in a motion, would be post-construction. Understood. And I just want to point out, I'm told by our engineer that three years ago uh, that they did dredge uh, the part of the stream behind 311 uh, North Elm. And again, you'd have to go to wetlands, as you point out, and, and I suspect that they might be generous in their support. Uh, matter of fact, the chairman mentioned it during the course of that, this last particular hearing about the possibility of coming back and looking to do something there. Okay, thank you. Other commission members would like to make comments uh, on the application? Uh, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Overton, um, you mentioned that you had um, done some computations and that there would be a, a a net 5% reduction in runoff to the stream to the west, I think, if I understood you correctly, was that? Correct, yes, it, it varies based on watershed, but it's roughly 5%, whether you look at either watershed or overall, about a 5% reduction. Yeah, and is that a computation that you submitted to us at all as part of this application? So yes, that's part of the stormwater management report that was submitted and has been reviewed by the town engineer. Is that something that we have in our packets? I, I don't... Uh, yes, it should have been as part of the actual uh, when the application was delivered it's called a drainage calculations I believe yeah it should have been and so I, I'm not a I'm not an expert you know I'm a layperson so when I take a look at these um, is there a particular map or something in this packet that shows that 5% um, net decrease? So there, there's no map in the site plan set that shows that. It would be in, in the drainage report. Okay. All right. Um, the, the other question I had for you is that, um, is there any way of monitor monitoring runoff? So after, after you put this in place, obviously the neighbor's concern is they had a prior um, development um, that, uh, in their opinion at least, increased the amount of water that was pooling in their backyards. Um, is there any, way to monitor runoff after a development has been completed? So monitoring runoff, uh, I, I guess the, the simplest way to do that would be to, to measure stream channel flow. Um, like the USGS uh, monitors stream flow on larger channels, uh, particular ones that have a floodplain associated with it. They have gauges usually located at bridges. Um, I would say that it's not easy in, to, to monitor that or to put a gauge in in a small stream such as this. And in order to compare um, post-development, you would really need to have a significant amount of data pre-development to make any sort of judgments as to whether there's any changes. And as part of that, would have to monitor rainfall for an extended period of time associated with any of those gauge type readings. So I, I would say that it could be done. Um, but it's not simple to do. And um, it, 
it's difficult to find meaningful conclusions um, in the data. Okay. I mean, because you were able to, I mean, were you able to, to determine what the current runoff is? Because you did do some sort of computation where you, you were able to determine that this would reduce the runoff by 5%. Yes, absolutely. So what we do is we, first of all, look at the surrounding watersheds. Um, we look at FEMA mapping to understand whether there's a floodplain. Um, we usually inquire with the local town engineers to understand whether there's any drainage concerns or issues in the area. Um, we look to the owner to understand whether there's any localized drainage issues. Um, and then as part of the computations, we look at the soils on site. The, that's a factor in the amount of surface water runoff. We looked at the vegetation. So we actually do calculations to estimate runoff under existing conditions as the site exists right now. With the existing home on it, the level of impervious surface, the level of wooded surface. And then under proposed conditions, we rerun those calculations um, based on the change in land cover. As you can imagine, and some of the public mentioned here tonight, there are concerns of loss of the, the wooded area. Um, when you convert a wooded area to a grassed area or impervious, um, you would increase runoff. So we then calculate the runoff based on the proposed condition, and that's how we actually size the stormwater management controls in order to um, mitigate for that increase in runoff. And those computations follow standard methodology that all engineers use that's been developed over the years, and we actually look at real rainfall numbers um, that are accumulated and published. And those are recently updated because I think as we have all seen, and you know, people have mentioned it here tonight, we are seeing an increase in rainfall. It's not just in Connecticut. If you look at historic information, you can see that over time um, the rainfall has increased. And we used to do our calculations based on what was called this TP40 publication that was based on rainfall data that was 50 years old. Um, there's new um, higher rainfall totals that have been adopted by the DOT and most towns um, encourage the use of those. We use those in all our calculations. So those take into account more um, recent rainfall data. Um, and, you know, we're, we're seeing it. I mean, it's, it's partly to do with climate change. It's partly to do with changes of what's happening in our weather patterns. But we are seeing increased rainfall and we're seeing some people mention that a 100-year um, storm occurs more frequently. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that it does, but we definitely have more higher intensity rainfall occurrences that occur. And we do monitor what, what happens in the environment. And as, as an industry, um, we, there's further guidance that's developed, and we continue to stay current with that guidance, and we prepare our stormwater management um, plans based on most recent guidance and it's it's not just individual private developments that we do we, we work on a lot of DOT projects and a wide range of different types of developments so we take in that, that into consideration in, in all of the work that we do um, I, I know it's not simple and it's really not simple to explain but there's established protocols that we follow in our industry and it's all based on those standards which has been reviewed by your town engineer and I, I believe she's comfortable with what we've prepared for this project yeah, and, and I appreciate that. I appreciate the response. Um, and my experience has been that um, Cho is, um, you know, has been a good neighbor and, and willing to, to work with uh, the community in general. So um, that's my uh, uh, experience with Cho. I guess my question would be, um, you know, um, you, you all as representatives of CHO um, have heard some of the concerns of the neighbors and um, what I could foresee happening is that, um, you know, this project uh, gets approved and then, um, you know, there, there's issues afterwards or, the, you know, one of the neighbors insists that this is you know, as soon as they built this, this development, you know, we're, we're getting more water in our backyards. My question to you as representatives of Choate is, um, 
is there anything that you can offer in terms of either monitoring for a certain amount of time uh, if this project were approved or anything um, that could be done that could be presented to the neighbors on a regular basis for you know a limited amount of time to show um, that there has not been any change in runoff because that that clearly is going to be one of their concerns going forward. So so there's a couple benefits to to the design um, that I think provide some assurance um, that this stormwater basin or what we're designing is not going to dump more water onto their property. Um, I did go up the street upstream and look at the stormwater pond that was built as part of the prior development and I did look at some historic aerials. It looks like that development um, was under construction in 1986 when I looked at the Yukon aerial for that. Um, and there was, you know, obviously um, a subdivision that was built, roadways that were built, and there was a basin that was built in the stream where all of that runoff went into the stream. And there's no place else for the water to go but to discharge into the stream um, and run through the properties um, of, of the folks that have been here tonight. Um, the difference what we're, and, and that basin has a fountain in it, it has a permanent pool, it, it's a pond. It's not just a stormwater management basin, it's a pond. What we've designed here is, is a stormwater management that basin that's designed to drain dry. It has an under drain in it, so it's not planned to have a permanent pool. So, and we also have a maintenance plan that was, um, is part of the project for that to be maintained so that we'll continue to drain dry over time. The other part of this is that the discharges from our stormwater basin drain onto the Choate property and into the stream. So they're not directed towards the neighbor's property. They are, their homes are all up gradient of our discharges. So if our discharge was to fail and discharge more water, it wouldn't necessarily affect the folks that are here tonight that have concerns about their, their yards. Um, and there is a comprehensive management plan that's part of the stormwater uh, design um, that we've submitted to the town engineer and again has been reviewed and we've taken into consideration uh, also some of the conditions of the Welton's approval. So I think there are some assurances in place and I wish I had a better answer for being able to monitor it, but it's, it's just very difficult to monitor changes in, in runoff, particularly with such um, small watershed areas. Um, like I said, the, the ones that the USGS monitors, those are large stream channels. Um, it, uh, I'd say it's easier to um, monitor and gauge those flows over time with, with larger watersheds. They're more predictable. Thank you, Mr. Hine. Uh, Mr. Menard, I believe you had a question or two for the applicant. No, I, I think as a good neighbor, I think that uh, Choke should be able to, with the neighbor's permission, be able to straighten this problem out with the flow. I don't think that's a, a big expense, and I think it would be, a, as a good neighbor, I think you should do that. Thank you, Mr. Menard. Any other commission members? Mr. Uh, Pagini, would you have any uh, final comments you'd like to make on the, uh, on the application? Uh, no, not at this time. And the applicant, uh, before, I, uh, before I close the public hearing, any final comments that you would like to make? I think we're set, Mr. Chairman. Good. Thank you. So at this point in time, if there's no more comments from commission members, from our staff, from, uh, from the applicant, I'd entertain a... Uh, entertain a motion to uh, close the public hearing. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to uh, <clears throat> close the public hearing for application 407-21, show Rosemary Hall. We have a second. Second. <clears throat> second by Mr. Uh, Hine. Uh, voting beginning with Mr. Cohan, please. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> and yes. Yes. And yes. So at this point in time, uh, is there any discussion on the application uh, or if a commission member would like to make a motion on the application? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to approve application 407-21, special Choate Rosemary Hall, special permit request to construct seven new detached dwelling units and a newly constructed private driveway to be used as faculty housing for 
currently operating private school as shown on plans entitled Choate Rosemary Hall, New Faculty Housing, dated July 9th, 2021, subject to uh, the following conditions of approval. Uh, number one, comments from Eric Kruger, Senior Engineer Water Sewer Division, dated August 4th, 2021. Number two, comments in interoffice memorandum <clears throat> from Aaron O'Hare, Environmental Planner, dated July 19th, 2021. Number three, comments in interoffice memorandum from the Department of Engineering to the Planning and Zoning Department, dated July 28th, 2021. Number four, an erosion and sedimentation control bond in the amount of $40,000. <clears> number five, uh, applicant will clean out the cross culvert on the site uh, behind 311 North Elm and maintain um, uh, periodic maintenance. Uh, number six, uh, applicant will work with Inland Wetlands to uh, get approval to uh, uh, periodically mow the uh, wet meadow in the uh, same location. And number seven, applicant will look over the uh, site for other impediments and uh, to the stream. Do we have, we have a motion on the application? Do we have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Hine. Voting beginning with Mr. Cohen. Yes. 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 And yes, the application has been approved. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on on the uh, agenda, our next item is uh, a uh, old business. It's a site plan for uh, six uh, research LLC at 4A Research Parkway. The applicant uh, and or its representative, please come forward to begin uh, preparing for their uh, presentation. And yes, if uh, Mr. Allenson, if you would please note all correspondence for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have an interdepartmental referral, date of submission April 8th, 2021 from our fire marshal. We have correspondence to six research LLC dated April 23rd, 2021 from Thomas Talbot. We have a memorandum from the Department of Engineering dated April 28th, 2021. We have an inter-office memorandum from Scott Shipman, Engineer Water and Sewer, dated April 29th, 2021. We have a stormwater management system computation package from Summer Hill, Civil Engineers and Land Surveyors, date of receipt, May 3rd, 2021. An inter-office memorandum from Eric Kruger, Senior Engineer, Water and Sewer Divisions, dated May 10th, 2021. Email correspondence, correspondence excuse me, from Dennis Senaviva, dated May 6th, 2021. A memorandum from Aaron O'Hare, Environmental Planner, dated June 8th, 2021. A memorandum from the Department of Engineering, dated June 2nd, 2021. An interdepartment referral from our fire marshal, date of submission, April 8th, 2021. Email correspondence from Dennis Senaviva, dated 6-11-2021. And correspondence to Allison Kapashinsky, town engineer, dated June 17th, 2021, from Summerhill Civil Engineers and Land Surveyors. Thank you very much, Mr. Allenson. If the applicant would please uh, introduce himself and begin the uh, presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For your record, my name is Dennis Senaviva. I'm an attorney with the Senaviva Law Firm, and I represent the owner and applicant. With me to my left <clears throat> is the project engineer, Michael Ott, from Summerhill Civil Engineers and Land Surveyors, who will be making the uh, technical part of the presentation this evening, Mr. Chair. Uh, by way of background, the property is a vacant 3.2-acre parcel of land it is located in the IX zone, as you see from our application. 
it abuts 6 Research Parkway to the north. That property was before this commission uh, back in uh, December through March, December of 18, 2018 through March 11th of 2019 when you approved an application for the development of a vehicle storage under appeal under uh, application 202-19. This is the same use of that site as currently exists as you've driven by, I'm sure, 6 Research Parkway. You may have been a you know, acknowledging property across the street, but you, hopefully you saw this piece too. Again, the same use, except that this parcel will have a building with no offices. The original approval at six research had, an, had office space, which is there. Uh, thus, there's no need for water and sewer in this building. Um, to develop the site uh, as an expansion of the uh, automotive storage facility is the application. There would be a new 6,000 square foot building, which Mike will explain. The original uh, at six is 9,720 9, square feet, so this is a smaller building, but it's really designed for storage, for vehicle storage. Uh, as in the uh, original approval for six research parkway, there would be no fueling, no repairs, no maintenance, uh, or washing of vehicles which would occur on this site. It would be for indoor storage. Again, that's identified in our narrative as part of the application. Uh, there is no separate access being proposed for this site. That's how, how it's merged into six, so that there still would remain the one curb cut uh, that's existing on six research. And with that, I'll turn it over, Mr. Chairman, to Michael Lott to explain the uh, particulars of the of the application. Good evening, Mr. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mr. Chairman and, and uh, Commission. Um, for the record, I'm Mike Ott. I'm a licensed professional engineer and land surveyor with Summerhill Civil Engineers. Um, with an office at 60 Wall Street in Madison, Connecticut. Um, I, I think Attorney um, Senevivo um, gave you a great, a great description of the project. Um, this is essentially a, an expansion of, of the existing facility at next door at 6 Research Parkway. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, the, and you may have said this, the intention is uh, the, for the owner to merge the two parcels once they are, um, it, should this application be approved. So um, I think the, the biggest, um, the, the thing I'd, I'd like to talk about the most on this site is um, stormwater management. The, the needs, um, you heard a lot about stormwater management just now in the previous application. Um, the needs of the owner um, require a large amount of pavement. In our stormwater management report, we know that there's, the, under the proposal, we'd pr be proposing an additional, uh, or I should say today, there is no impervious land surface cover on this property. The, the property is undeveloped. Um, and our proposal would create 61,700 square foot round numbers of impervious surface, mostly pavement. The building is only 6,000 square feet in roof area. The remainder of that 61.7 would be pavement, and it's and it's driven by the needs of the owner and the operation of the facility, uh, the the car carrier vehicles, if you if you recall, uh, the previous application. So, in order to um, because we're within the watershed protection district, and because this site drains to the south along Research Parkway and then ultimately crosses Research Parkway and surface water runoff enters a, a wetland on the east side of Research Parkway and that wetland uh, ultimately drains to the Muddy River and to Mackenzie Reservoir as we've noted in our report. We have um, designed a pretty extensive stormwater management system focusing both on water quality and on the control of peak discharges, peak, peak rates of discharge of stormwater runoff. So we're taking an undeveloped site that's relatively flat, a little, a little bit of rolling topography. Um, it, it, was, um, it was mowed uh, for the survey, but prior to being mowed, it, it was all brush, uh, lightly wooded and brush. So we're, the proposal is to take that and build this new building and all this pavement. So we've designed a um, stormwater sand filter that accepts runoff from all that parking, all that pavement area. Um, 
the, that sand filter in simple terms takes care of water quality. It meets the town's water department standards. It's been reviewed by the town's water department. Um, and uh, higher flows above water quality rainfall events or rainfall depths are, are directed to a proposed stormwater management basin in the lower right corner of the site. It would be the south. Excuse me, it'd be beneficial if perhaps, uh, just for the benefit of the commission and for any members of the public who may be viewing this, if you could uh, just point that out on the, uh, you know, on the map there. And then just give a, a, just a general overview, if you would, too, of the, the entire project for, you know, people who may be looking at this and somewhat interested in, in exactly what this is. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, I, I wasn't sure you'd be able to see this very well or the camera would be able to pick it up. Um, so... Um, Research Parkway on the right-hand side of the sheet, up and down the sheet. Um, this is a through lot, has the, the parcel has frontage on, on Thorpe Avenue on the left-hand side of the sheet, um, uh, north and running north and south also. Um, <clears throat> the upper part of the sheet is the existing six Research Parkway facility. Um, and this is, this is the existing driveway that serves that facility and will also serve this one. Um, the lower part of the sheet is the undeveloped parcel 4A. Um, the um, proposed building is in the south, would be the southwest corner of the lower parcel here. This, this gray rectangle, 6,000 square feet. The sand filter, stormwater sand filter, and stormwater management basin on the, on the east side of the site, um, closest to Research Parkway and the, that large pavement area in the middle of that site that I spoke about. So stormwater runoff, <clears throat> excuse me, stormwater runoff from this large parking area gets directed to the stormwater sand filter. That handles water quality. Um, higher, a greater rainfall depths than the water quality depth get, get diverted to this large stormwater management basin which controls peak discharges before all, all stormwater runoff is discharged at the, at the current discharge location at the lower, um, lower right of the site, the southeast corner of the site. Stormwater runoff today and, and will, when this is developed, um, flows to the south on the west side, of, on our side, on the west side of Research Parkway. Um, it, it enters the stormwater management facilities of the next developed site to the south, already developed site, and then crosses Research Parkway to the east and enters that wetland that I talked about that's associated with the Muddy River. So um, the site design is, is pretty simple. It's, it's you know, ju just like the other site, it's, it's basically a a large paved area to accommodate the, um, the car carrier vehicles and the building that attorney um, Senaviva described. The same, exact same type of exterior lighting that's on, the, that's on the Six Research Parkway site will be proposed on, on this site. Uh, the same type, same height, same type of chain link fencing around the parking area that's on, the, on this site today. Uh, and again, this no new driveway required. This will be the access driveway, and, and I, I believe ultimately the parcels will be merged. I think that I think that's the that's the plan of the owner. Mike, if you can point out how far back uh, that impervious area goes, and that there's still a pretty significant buffer between the rear of the developed part of this parcel and Thorpe, and the balance of our piece, just like last time. Yes. Um, so the. The most westerly proposed edge of parking and building is, is here where I'm tracing with my finger. And there's approximately 150 feet uh, between that most westerly limit of parking and building and Thorpe Avenue. And that, that area, will th there will be no activity in that area. And the existing vegetation along, along the street line of Thorpe Avenue will remain. So there's a, there's a good 150-foot uh, buffer here between, between the proposed um, 
construction and for gravity. Thank you. If I might, Mr. Chair, again, just a couple of um, operational points that come from uh, the meeting we had back on March of 2019. Uh, some of the uh, commissioners who are sitting here tonight were concerned about um, fumes or, or, or smoke uh, or exhaust rather from, from vehicles. Mr. Quartuccio, the owner, had indicated at that time that all of his vehicles were relatively new in 2019. They were 2016 or newer and that all of them had their exhaust underneath the vehicle uh, so that it wouldn't uh, emanate out to the, uh, to the neighbors. Uh, there was also a concern, yes, um, two, yeah, they have two catalytic converters and a muffler. The exhaust system is located underneath the trucks, uh, and he indicated back in 2019 at night, no one will know they were running. Um, you had asked, Mr. Chairman, at that point, what was the distance from the property line to the fence on the west side of the property, as Mike just pointed out, and then it was approximately 120 feet, and I think it's about 150, so it's kind of a similar distance away. Um, and that was designed specifically to make sure that there was no uh, impact for the residential neighbors in that industrial zone on Thorpe Avenue. Okay. Is that the extent of your presentation? It sir? is, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Just uh, before I ask other commission members, just what, what I'm looking at, it kind of begs the obvious question. The, the existing site, it's a larger building, and it appears to be a lot less impervious surface, I think. And then on the new side, it's a smaller building and, you know, more impervious surface and appears more parking for, I guess, the uh, car carriers. The, right. uh, you know, and I think it, it, the last, uh, or the prior application it was mentioned, you, some of those car carriers could be 18 wheelers, some of them could be smaller. Uh, there is, one, if you can explain just why smaller building, more impervious surface, how that operates, and then also the fact that uh, it's my understanding that there's no overnight parking uh, for the car carriers. Is, is that correct? And that's not the intent? That, yeah, that's not the intent. I, again, my understanding is that the vehicles uh, go out usually on a Sunday or Monday and they come back Mr. Quartuccio indicated either on a Wednesday or Friday, depending on where they're going. It was all up and down the eastern Eastern. seaboard. Mm -hmm. So that it it really was a question of, of, uh, he has another site uh, in Wallingford where he does all the repairs and maintenance. So this would be his quote unquote clean location. Uh, The the reason for, um, certainly the building was to house uh, more luxury vehicles. There's been a a pretty significant um, uptick in, in that area of his business and so uh, that's the genesis of this 6,000 square foot building that would be housing vehicles inside. I think to Mr. Hines question last time would there be any lifts? There were no, there are no lifts there or none, none planned in this uh, operation. Um, what else? But again, why the more, again it appears that there's more impervious surface there. What, what, what would be the, the reason for that? Then looking at the looking at the other building again, we have a, a larger building, a lot less uh, impervious surface. I think it's a this is a smaller piece than the first. I'm, I'm not sure Mike would know. I, I thought it was uh, at the 3.2 acres. The uh, I do know that the proposal, as we said in our narrative, to be about 15, 18 wheel delivery trucks leave the site for deliveries every Sunday night or Monday and return on Friday of the same week. So it was. You may recall there was a, a, a limit of eight uh, tra- tractor trailers or car carriers uh, in the original plan, and so that's why the need for additional impervious area. I think the other thing where they were concerned about, and you and your engineering department wanted to make sure that all the movements of the trucks can be done on site. I mean, so there's no backing into research, and, and I think part of the, the need for that pavement area is, is the truck movements. Thank you. Commission members with uh, questions for the applicant? Mr. Hine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to be clear for the record, there will not be any um, repairs being performed at this site. That's correct. correct. And there will not be any um, uh, washing, vehicle washing or or car washes or anything like that being performed at the site. No maintenance. I think think your water department actually um, 
spelled that out also in their memorandum. I yeah, that's yeah. Good. I just, I, for the record, I just want to be clear that that's, uh, that's the intent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Klein. Any other commission members? Any other commission members? <laughs> Mr. Pagini, any uh, comments that you'd like to uh, make on the application? Uh, no comment. And seeing that there are no members of the public here, I don't believe any members of the public would like to speak. So with that, unless the applicant would like to make any further uh, comments on the application, I bring it back to the commission for a uh, motion on the application. We are set, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to approve application uh, 210-21-6 Research LLC for a research parkway. Site plan approval request for an automotive storage facility located at 6 slash 4A Research Parkway as shown on plans entitled Eastside Auto Transport Automotive Storage Facility dated April 2021 and revised to June 2nd, 2021, subject to the following conditions of approval. Number one, sedimentation and erosion control bond in the amount of $10,000. Number two, comments in inner office memorandum from the Department of Engineering to the Planning and Zoning Department dated April 28th, 2021 and June 2nd, 2021. Number three, comments in inner office memorandum from the Fire Marshal to the Planning and Zoning Department dated 4 15 21 2021. Number four, comments in inner office memorandum from the Water and Sewer Division to the Planning and Zoning Department dated 4-29-2021 and 5-10-2021. Number five, comments in inner office memorandum from the Environmental Planner to the Planning and Zoning Department dated June 8th, 2021. Thank you. We have a motion on the application. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Hine. Voting beginning with Mr. Cohan, please. Yes. 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 And yes, your application has been approved. Have a good evening, gentlemen. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, it brings us down to our bond releases and reductions. I guess at this point in time, Mr. Pagini, I'll let you uh, take the wheel for the, uh, you would for the rest of the uh, rest of the agenda. Sure, I'm just going to start with a uh, staff update on the IX and I-5 regulations. Uh, uh, just jumping back, Mr. Ed, are there any bond releases or reductions being recommended? Uh, yes, the, I'm oh, sorry, the, uh, the number eight is being recommended. Number seven has not submitted uh, as built as of yet. So number eight would be a complete release of the, uh, of the bond, is that correct? Correct. Do we have, do we have a, a motion on a release of the Thurston Associates 3 Thurston Drive bond? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to uh, uh, release the bond from Site Plan Thurston Associates, 30 Thurston Drive. We have a uh, motion to release the bond. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Hine. Voting beginning with Mr. Cohen, please. Yes. 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 And yes, the bond has been released in. Again, Mr. Uh, Pagini, if you'd please continue. So uh, the, just wanted to give an update on the IX and I-5 regulations. Um, we had an initial meeting to discuss the proposal on the first draft of the regulations that was held on July 8th. Uh, we met with uh, town departments, uh, received input at that meeting. Uh, private meetings were then held with uh, Water and Sewer Economic Development and Corporation Council. Uh, comments were gathered from those departments and incorporated into a second draft of those regulations. Um, the second draft of those regulations just went out on Friday um, and they were distributed to all town departments and hopefully we'll get a second round of comments and sometimes in the, sometime in the next 10 days we plan to hold another full staff meeting uh, with all of the town departments to gather their input and hopefully our plan is to hold a workshop before the September meeting on the regulations. Before our September meeting? Correct. Uh, if 
that's possible. I don't know how. Yeah, I, I think we, I'm not quite sure with, with as far, I, well, that's something we'll have to uh, send out. Uh, once, once you're in a position, uh, at least I would suggest, once you're in a position sure. to, uh, to have a workshop, then we can send out, you know, to commission members to see exactly what their, uh, what their availability is. I'm confident with what we have in the uh, second draft right now that we can get a workshop going in the next couple of weeks, I would think so. And if you'd please continue. Uh, just administrative approvals. Any questions on those? Uh, just change of use uh, for uh, axe throwing business to allow liquor on site. Um, a change of use at 321 North Colony Street, a uh, change of use at 920 South Colony Road, and a site plan for uh, 40 Carpenter Lane to construct a small overhang there. Any questions on those? And then on to ZBA decisions. Remember ZBA decisions. That's why I had to, ha and I'm unprepared. But um, we have no meeting, no ZBA meeting for the month of August. Um, as you're experiencing, it, it's it's high vacation, etc. Time. So um, we all, right now. I have. You know, I'll lead right into my enforcement report, which which encompasses it. What we've been doing uh, of late and I'm test driving my new report on you. Uh, so I'll give you a monthly report activity, sort of where the efforts are being focused, and that ties into the ZBA decisions too. Right now we seem to be very heavy on big violations trying to be served by use variances. So, um, and, and also some construction after the fact. Uh, bulk standard, uh, area variances, again, to allow something that's already occurred. So that seems to be where it's at. Um, expecting a couple new things for September, have not gotten them yet, so can't really tell you what's on the agenda coming up. But if that, if that sort of format on the new report was my first sort of going at it rather than sending you the same list, Month after month after month, I thought it would it would be more telling and uh, more informative in that format. So, excuse me. Any commission members with any uh, with any comments uh, for uh, Mrs. Tory or for her uh, reporting? Good. So, with that, I believe it brings us to unless there's any other business to come before the commission, I believe that. Uh, So with that, uh, again, we've come to our uh, the end of our uh, you know of our agenda. So at this particular point in time, I'd uh, entertain a uh, entertain a motion to uh, to adjourn. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn our August 9th meeting. Do we have a second. Second. Second by Mr. Hine. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? We're adjourned. Thank you very much, gentlemen.